So I, I think we're going to get started. If everyone could take their, their seats, get their coffees or waters, bring them to their tables. Um, we're going to get started here. Great. So wel welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome to CSIS. Thanks for weathering the, the cold weather, the rain this morning. I know it can be a nuisance here in DC. Uh, I want to thank you all for joining us uh, today. We're, we're truly grateful to have you with us. I'm thrilled to be co-hosting today's event with my colleague Elizabeth Newhouse, uh, the director of the Cuba Project at the Center for International Policy. Uh, before we get to uh, Senator Flake's remarks, I just want to offer a brief uh, explanation of what makes today's conference titled Getting to Normal, a Legal Pathway uh, for U.S.-Cuba Policy Reform Different from All Cuba uh, Gatherings that Take Place Periodically Here in D.C. Uh, it's interesting, as I look in the crowd, I see uh, a lot of familiar faces. Welcome to everybody, uh, folks that have covered uh, Cuba for a long time. Um, so I, I just want to uh, sort of justify why uh, on a rainy morning in Washington, D.C., we're here to talk about Cuba. Um, let me start by telling you a bit about what this conference is not shooting for. Uh, today's event will not focus on debating if normalized relations should or should not be the goal of the bilateral relationship. Uh, to be clear, this conference will not be taking a position on that question. Instead, our goal today will be to answer a question that is seldom asked, which is, if the President of the United States were interested in normalizing relations with Cuba, how could this actually take place? legally, diplomatically, and practically. And, and there are a series of questions that follow from that broader theme, such as what would be the process? Who needs to be involved? What are the legal steps? And are there case studies around the world we could look to for guidance? In a lot of ways, this conference is an outgrowth of a series of discussions among myself, Elizabeth, and our good friend Robert Muse, who's moderating our main panel discussion today and who has worked on Cuba issues for decades. Their political and legal knowledge, <laughs> their political and legal knowledge and my own policy background together raised the questions we're hoping to address through this event. Those conversations and as a result, this conference developed at a fascinating time for the US and Cuba. Most recently, Panama, the host of the 2015 Summit of the Americas invited Cuba to participate for the first time, despite objections by the White House. And uh, this might, to be, might be, uh, or might prove to be a decision-forcing moment, pushing the administration to set a course for the final two years of the president's term. Ultimately, this could amount to an opportunity for the long, stagnant bilateral relationship. But the same issues that have traditionally muddied the waters are still relevant. The embargo, the Cuba Three, the state of human rights in Cuba continues to be dubious at best. The island still depends on Venezuelan aid that seems to be on increasingly shaking ground as the Venezuelan economy fully or uh, further deteriorates. And as many of you know, tomorrow's the five-year anniversary of US contractor Alan Gross's imprisonment on the island. But we're here not to talk about these issues, not to dig into those issues today, even though they do provide important context for this and any discussion of the bilateral relationship. So what we're here to offer is an exercise, one that I think is long overdue, an exploration of the what if rather than a debate over the should we. I couldn't feel more strongly that this is the right moment to engage in this conversation. This morning's sessions will be thought provoking. My hope is that we all leave here with a more robust understanding of the process of change in a relationship often treated as a foregone conclusion. So once again, I want to thank you all for being here at this conference today. And now I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker and give you all a sense of how today will proceed. I'm honored to have US Senator Jeff Flake of Arizona here with us as our keynote speaker. Uh, so I thank you for joining us, sir. Senator Flake has a long history on U.S.-Cuba policy issues, and he's a vocal proponent of lifting the travel ban. Actually, when we were walking in, uh, Senator reminded me 
of uh, the work he's been doing for many years and, and of the work I think we, we shared uh, uh, when I was uh, working for Senator Luger on the Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, and those are pleasant memories. Still, it's like pushing a, a boulder up a, up a hill. But um, he recently participated in a congressional trip to Cuba and his profile on the issue looms large. Without a doubt, the senator has invaluable insights to share, and I'm grateful that he was able to join us today. Senator Flake has also graciously agreed to take some questions from the audience following his remarks. When that segment ends at 9.45, uh, we will have a quick break before beginning the panel discussion introduced by Elizabeth Newhouse and moderated by Robert Muse. Unfortunately, our luncheon uh, keynote speaker, Ambassador Tom Pickering, is unable to uh, be here today. He was called away to China on pressing business uh, at the 11th hour, and his presence, though, uh, will be missed. But I think that uh, we have a very good panel and a very uh, interesting set of folks here as well, a cross-section of all the folks that have done Cuba for so many years. So I know that the conversation and the questions will be very, very good. Uh, but in lieu of his remarks, uh, we'd like to use the luncheon as an opportunity to engage in a lively discussion of the morning's proceedings. So I'd like to thank you all once again for being here today. I'd like to remind you all that today's session is on the record and we're live webcasting the proceedings uh, uh, to our online audience. I'd like to welcome C-SPAN as well and thank you for your coverage. And without further delay, Senator Flake, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, thank you, Carl. I appreciate it. It's nice to be here at CSIS. Um, I'm reminded that uh, when I first came to Washington in the late 80s as an intern uh, in Senator DeConcini's office, a Democrat from Arizona. I've had to purge that from my resume, you know, <laughs> lately. No, Senator DeConcini was working on uh, Africa politics, in particular, uh, the, the agreement that was coming together in Southern Africa uh, by which the country of Namibia could obtain its independence. And I relied uh, a lot on the, uh, the work of CSIS at that time. I believe the staffer who worked on it was Sean McCormick. That's something probably you guys don't remember, yeah. but, uh, but I do about CSIS in the late 80s. Uh, I've always been impressed uh, with the scholarship and the, the research that has gone on here. Um, but it's, 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 so it's great to be here this morning. It's never a bad time to review a policy that has failed to produce results for 50 years. Uh, but uh, even given that, it's, a, it's certainly a, a timely conference today, uh, given some recent developments. Um, I, people often ask where my interest in Cuba came from. Uh, I did mention that uh, my early work in, in Africa, uh, Cuba was always there somehow. The agreement to, for Namibian independence to happen and my wife and myself, we spent a year in Namibia in 1989 through 90, the year that Namibia gained its independence from South Africa. But that agreement only came about after an agreement for the Cuban troops to leave Angola. And so it seems to be a, kind of an issue that's followed me around uh, wherever I've been uh, in, in my career. But uh, people ask, you know, an Arizona senator, why are you involved like this? Um, and I tell them, well, I took a poll among Cuban Americans in Arizona, and uh, both of them said, go right ahead, we like what you're doing. <laughs> so it's, it's never been about that issue, about a constituency, or Arizona doesn't have uh, you know, farm produce we sell to Namibia, there's not a lot of trade or, or travel back and forth. But for me, it's always been just an issue of freedom. Uh, Americans should be able to travel wherever they want, unless there's a compelling national security reason otherwise. There is none here. Uh, there hasn't been for a long, long time. Several weeks ago, uh, Senator Tom Udall and I traveled uh, to Havana. Uh, among other things, we were interested in seeing the, the scope and the impact of the economic changes that the Cuban government has been pursuing. As you're no doubt aware, the, the Cubans have loosened restrictions on private enterprise. Uh, they're looking to expand the use of cooperatives, and they have passed a new foreign investment law um, but also, as you're no doubt aware, um, though expanding the, the private sector is a very positive development and one that, uh, that looks to be more ir irreversible than changes in the past, the current regime is far from having seen the light 
on capitalism. I was reminded of this one. I, I took a delegation down there in, I think, 2006. And uh, since I was heading the delegation, you always have the conundrum when you have meetings, official meetings, you have a gift and exchange a gift with uh, the government and with Cuba. It's an issue because uh, there's a gift ban and there's issues of what you can give or trade or whatever else. And uh, so you don't want to take cufflinks from the capital or, or things like that. Uh, so I thought, uh, well, I'll just take care of that myself. So I got a couple of books that I gave to government officials as uh, we met with them. Uh, one was uh, Milton Friedman's Capitalism and Freedom, <laughs> Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations. <laughs> Another was Hernando de Soto's Mystery of Capital. And uh, I got kind of bemused looks back. <laughs> Probably wasn't a very good thing to do, but I enjoyed the reaction that I received. Uh, but, you know, the, the Cuban government certainly hasn't seen the light uh, um, or hasn't realized that they're going to have a full-throated defense of capitalism, but they have taken measures that I think uh, because of some other developments that I'll talk about in a minute, are, are far more irreversible, are, are likely to last and have a positive effect for the long term. Uh, the country remains cash-strapped. As uh, Carl mentioned, uh, continued support from Venezuela is anything but certain. Uh, these reforms, uh, I, I believe, are based on a realistic assessment of their precarious economic situation. Now, uh, these economic arrangements have all the clunkiness that uh, you would associate with a communist state trying to achieve economic activity through the right mix of government control and state planning. Uh, but I can tell you from years of traveling to the island that the level of tension and the level of rhetoric are noticeably lower, uh, and that is a good thing. In previous trips back in 2002, 3, 4, uh, there was noticeable tension and, and provocative actions on the part of both the Cuban government and ourselves. The, the Cuban interest section uh, that we have right along the Malacan, uh, we had a ticker there, like a stock ticker that, that uh, just spewed out uh, provocative uh, messages to the Cuban people, and the Cubans responded by erecting hundreds of flags uh, right in front of it. Uh, the interest section is still there, the flag poles are still there, the ticker is gone, and so are the flags. And there hasn't been a protest or demonstration there in, in quite a while. Uh, back home here, the, the suggestion is that the administration is ready to take uh, further steps to modernize uh, U.S.-Cuba policy. Uh, these rumors have reached a fever pitch. I, for one, uh, as a Republican, uh, want to be the first to say that the changes that the president has advanced with respect to lifting restrictions on Cuban-American travel and uh, limitations on remittances are a good thing. Uh, they are well done and, uh, in my view, have done a lot to advance uh, the policy that we would all like to see with Cuba. Loosening uh, restrictions on U.S. remittances uh, has coincided well with the expansion of opportunities for Cuban entrepreneurs. I believe this timely infusion of funding has done more to transparently improve the options of everyday Cubans and change the equation on that island than the now hundreds of millions of dollars that we've spent on USAID boondoggles or beaming jammed programming to the island. Um, I uh, have always felt that uh, that these programs, uh, these hundreds of millions of dollars that we have spent, have done more to create jobs in Miami than freedom in Cuba. This administration has taken further steps to create a context in which uh, the two countries can at least interact. Uh, for example, resuming a conversation on migration and uh, rotating the chief of mission to the interest section, U.S. interest section there, that has had previous experience in Cuba. These are good things. Here's hoping that the administration uh, will do more. From my perspective, uh, oh, the changes we really need uh, are some leadership from Congress. As Carl said, I've long supported lifting the Cuba uh, embargo wholesale. I would do the whole thing, but I focus mostly on the travel ban. Um, we formed the, the Cuba study group as soon as I got to Congress. Um, in 2001, myself and Bill Delahunt 
had a bipartisan group uh, for every Republican we added to it. We added a Democrat as well, and that was a very effective organization. We were able to um, pass legislation twice that would prohibit funding for enforcement of the travel ban, the only way we could get legislation to the floor at that time. Uh, we passed it out of the House. It passed in the Senate. Uh, we just couldn't get the president to sign it. Uh, now we have a president that will sign it, and it's difficult to pass. <laughs> so we've kind of been in a conundrum here, and uh, I've lamented uh, that fact more than, than, than once. Um, but uh, we have the administration considering taking uh, additional steps, as I, I said, and uh, when they do, uh, they will certainly have my support and the support of other Republicans uh, in, in Congress, as well as a lot of Democrats. At a minimum, there are things that could be done to increase the flexibility of U.S. citizens to travel to Cuba. Uh, we could expand the people-to-people -people categories significantly. We could move the needle on Internet access as well. Uh, I've always felt that uh, we could do more just allowing Americans to travel. If we want uh, Cubans to have more access to, to Internet, to, to have more access to electronic devices to which they could more easily access information uh, that we want them to access. That happens organically. Uh, it happens free of charge uh, to the government when Americans are free to travel to Cuba uh, instead of us trying to do clumsy programs administered uh, by USAID that really not only expose uh, contractors to risk, uh, but cheapen USAID's mission uh, around the rest of the world. So, so I, I hope that we'll continue to work on the travel issue. It uh, goes without saying that uh, we need to pivot away from the quasi-covert uh, programs. Uh, like I mentioned, Cuba Twitter, uh, this debacle gives the U.S. a black eye uh, all around the world, not just uh, in Cuba or the Western Hemisphere. Um, I've always uh, felt that we shouldn't let Cuba write our foreign policy. We've had an issue with both Republicans and Democrats in the White House uh, where we'll take the position that we will take measures like further lifting of the travel ban or loosening the economic embargo when Cuba takes certain measures. Uh, I think that's the wrong calculus. Um, that is based on an assumption that, uh, that, that the Cuban government wants that to happen. Uh, I have never been convinced, uh, although at times they want it, at times they don't. And they seem to get spooked when we do uh, make some changes to better relationships uh, with, with the Cuban people and, and with the government. And so we shouldn't base our policy based on what we think the Cubans want or don't want. Uh, we ought to base our policy on what's good for our national security and what has a history of working elsewhere in the world. Uh, so we shouldn't uh, put Cuba in charge of our foreign policy. We ought to enact what we know is right. Um, if the past has been any sort of prologue, uh, we can't write the script for Cuba. Uh, only the Cuban people can, but we can have an influence. And it's time to think about uh, our influence in Cuba and realize that it's changing. The economic model, as we all know, as every Cuban realizes, has been a failure. The private sector in Cuba is now growing, and a new generation is in the wings. Uh, let me just uh, close by saying that clearly the elephant in the room uh, when it comes to ha what happens next in Cuba uh, with respect to bilateral relations is a continued detention of former USAID contractor Alan Gross. Uh, Senator Udall and I had the opportunity to meet with Alan while we were in Havana. Uh, I won't characterize that discussion any further than to say that he really wants to come home. Uh, after five years, he wants and needs to come home. And I sincerely hope that the administration is doing everything that we can uh, to make that happen. Again, I appreciate the chance to be here this morning, and I now look forward to being grilled by Carl. <laughs> so thank you for having me here. <laughs> on. Well, I'm going to try to grill you for about 10 minutes. No. Um, now, I mean, you know, you mentioned a, a little bit in your opening remarks um, 
that things had changed. Could you, could you describe a little bit the environment when you were down there? What, what makes it so different? Because, again, you know, people talk about Cuba, and there have been moments, waves, where we've seen that there's an opportunity, and then that goes away, that being, I mean, really going further back, uh, you know, the Brothers to the Rescue, or mm -hmm. the issue with Alan Groves, uh, where we've had opportunities, and there's an opening or a willingness to do things differently in the United States, and in Cuba, we perceive, and then it shuts. Mm -hmm. What's so different about uh, the situation right now? Well, I mentioned one of the differences is there's the, the level of, of rhetoric and kind of tension between the countries has, has bettered. Uh, I don't think it was productive of uh, that period of time we had yeah. uh, when the U.S. interest section was in the business of basically trying to provoke uh, the Cubans at every step. I don't think it did us or them any good. Um, Today, that, that has lessened, but significantly, uh, the amount of uh, private entrepreneurship that is happening there is significant. Um, you can characterize the government's approach and what they're trying to do. You can uh, criticize the, 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 the new foreign investment law, and I do, and everybody does. Those measures uh, have their limits. Uh, but what is undeniable is that the private entrepreneurship, largely because of the change in policy, allowing Cuban Americans to travel freely to the island, some 400,000 a year, trips a year, and uh, lifting limits on remittances, allowing direct investment uh, by family members and others um, in, uh, in enterprises there. You, you get the sense when you travel to Cuba now that uh, unlike you know, during the so-called special period where the government faced the decline of uh, Soviet subsidies and had to rely on private businesses, restaurants, uh, to you know, give some level of economic growth. As soon as that, uh, you know, the, the, the pressure lessened, yeah. then they pulled back. You get the sense today that that would be extremely difficult, if not impossible, for the government to do. Uh, the, the level of investment, the level of entrepreneurship, and the taste that, that people now have of that um, is, is irreversible. I think that's the feeling I get. Okay. Um, from my experience in, in the Senate, and, and one of my colleagues here, who was my counterpart for years with uh, Senator Biden, Fulton Armstrong is here as well, um, there's a knowledge or an understanding of Cuba based on sort of the champions of one side of debate over the champions of another side of debate. And you seem to be a champion for the issues that have to do with reforming the policy, changing certain aspects of it. You mentioned USAID and reforming that. You mentioned travel and reforming that. Are there others? Because for years we've had uh, you know, folks in the House and folks in the Senate being on one side of the discussion, that being the ones of keeping sort of uh, the, the issue where it is mm -hmm. and, and not reforming and, and justified by, their, by rationale that they don't want to reward right. the Cuban government. Are there other senators uh, on the Republican side in particular uh, that share your views on this issue? There are, and we saw that reflected in, in votes that we took you know, uh, six, eight years ago. Uh, there have been a lot of changes in Congress, um, but the longer you go, just because of time, uh, you have more people just saying, all right, it's, it's time. You know. 48 years wasn't long enough, but 52 is, you know? <laughs> and so just the passage of time has changed some calculation. And the, the discussion about what is a reward for the Cubans and what is not uh, is changing, I think, as well. I, I hope it is. Uh, I mentioned that our policy um, has, too, has, has been too based on what we think the Cubans want or what we perceive as their interest, and I think their interest changes. I think at some point they're all ready to uh, relax or the, the travel ban, but then uh, I think sometimes if we threw open the gates and let Americans travel, the Cubans would certainly impose restrictions of their own mm -hmm. because they want the revenue and not the influence. But I've always thought if somebody's going to limit my travel, it ought to be a communist, <laughs> you know, not, not, not my own government. <laughs> I mean, that, that's their prerogative, that's their purview. It shouldn't be ours. And as far as reward, I've always say, thought, uh, I've joked, but only half joking, that uh, the biggest punishment to the Castro regime would be to 
allow spring break <laughs> in Cuba, allow Americans to travel there. Uh, they may wave the white flag after that and say, you know. Um, but but we, we have, to, have to think in different ways about uh, rewards and punishments, but I think the default ought to be what is in our national interest? What has history proven to be effective in other countries uh, to change other governments? And we ought to look at that rather than trying to divine whether this benefits or hurts uh, the Cuban government. So, and I, I do think there are uh, many in Congress ready to make that calculation. And there's also, uh, you take an issue like internet access. Uh, when I talk to those who are very opposed to, to what I've been talking about here and, and very much want to punish the, the regime, um, there's agreement, I think, with everybody that internet access is a good thing uh, for Cubans. There are steps that can be taken that don't involve sending contractors down to clandestinely set up programs or whatever else, but there are things, uh, small changes that we can make to regulations that we have that would let that happen uh, organically or evolve uh, just, just given the course of events. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I think that there are ways that we can work across the aisle that way. Okay. Not just across the aisle, but across, uh, this isn't just a partisan thing, obviously. But it seems like there could be a bipartisan moment in the light I think of so. this. Yeah, and, and, and I think it would be welcome. I think the American public wants to see uh, Republicans and Democrats working together on these difficult issues. But on the technology issue in particular, when you were there, did you feel that there was a willingness from the Cuban side, or did you, uh, or was your idea met with opposition on, on technology and the proliferation of technology and such? Well, I, I think, I mean, the Cuban government, uh, First and foremost, uh, everything is about control. Uh, they want to have as much control for as long as, as they can. Um, the question is, you know, can they, uh, can they uh, exercise that control and still give, an, give uh, the Cuban people what they want and expect now? And it was, it was fascinating. This time you ask about what's changed. There's always ways that people get around restrictions that are there. Uh, or f find ways to, to access uh, entertainment or recreation that they, they like. And the, the, the recent phenomenon down there is uh, something called, the, they call it the packet, or the, the Spanish word for packet, uh, where somebody will download basically a, a package of entertainment, whether it's Game of Thrones or some uh, Mexican novellas or, or whatever else, and, uh, and people will come to a central place uh, under Wi-Fi and, and download that. And, and it, uh, let me tell you, virtually every Cuban, it seems, in Havana has access to this somehow. And the Cuban, Cuban government knows it. And uh, while it doesn't sanction it, it allows it uh, because I think it kind of fills a gap that they aren't filling. And as long as uh, they don't assume that people are are downloading political things or whatever else, then they simply let it go. So I, I, I think that uh, things that we can do to allow internet access, for example, to allow uh, US cell phone companies to, to operate, um, sure, the Cuban government uh, fears that. They, they want to restrict it. But you come to a point where you can't anymore, just like on the travel issue. I think the Cuban government would obviously like the revenue, but not the influence. So they would try uh, to you know, decide who to allow in. But you just can't do that for very long. In the end, freedom wins out. And, and so I think we just ought to give it more opportunity. Before I open it up for a couple of questions from the audience, just a quick uh, question. On, on the travel uh, bill, I'm assuming you're going to reintroduce it uh, in, the, in, the, in the new Congress. Right. Um, do you get a willingness from the administration that if you're able to pass it through Congress that they would sign it, that the president would sign it? Um, uh, that's, that's certainly my expectation. And uh, uh, the, the administration has taken you know, measures on its own to relax the travel ban mm -hmm. and to increase opportunities for people-to-people -people contact. And so it's my assumption that uh, they would be, but I don't want to speak for the okay. administration there. Okay. Let me. Uh, get some questions from, from the audience. Let me first go here with Ted, um, and then we'll go from there. 
Thank you, you Senator Flake. Ted Pacome from the Brookings Institution. Mm -hmm. I have a specific question on a subject that didn't come up in your remarks, which is the fact that Cuba is still listed on the state sponsors of terrorism list. And a lot has changed in Cuba to indicate that they really don't belong on that list. And I'm wondering how you look at that issue and if you have any specific recommendations for the president who could take steps on his own to address that. How would that be received in Congress? Uh, that, that, that's a tough one whenever you try to go the other direction, uh, given the threats that are out there and the perceptions. Uh, but I, I've felt for a long time that uh, that that list ought to mean something. And in this case, uh, it doesn't. Um, the, the, uh, the, that is an impediment uh, to uh, certainly modernizing uh, relations with Cuba. And uh, I, I don't think that for the reasons that we have those rules and regulations, I don't think that Cuba belongs on that list. So I've advocated for a long time to lift it. Gentleman over here. John McAuliffe from the Fund for Reconciliation and Development. Uh, first, to thank you for the struggles that you engaged in as a House member and wishing you luck for equal success in mobilizing your Republican colleagues and Democratic colleagues in the Senate now. Um, I want to press a bit on the travel. You referred to broadening licenses. Um, do you mean to, uh, for people to people, do you mean that, that you see OFAC continuing to license but for broader categories, or do you mean that there should be a general license for people to people and other purposeful travel that would allow all Americans to have the same kind of liberty that Cuban Americans have? Yes, I, I think it's, it's particularly since the Cuban government has relaxed restrictions on travel of Cubans uh, abroad, uh, that, you know, that's always been one of the excuses that's been used. You know, why should we allow the travel of Americans there where the Cubans uh, won't allow travel elsewhere? They've largely lifted those restrictions, and not completely, but largely. And so I, I would advocate a general license for purposeful travel um, and just our people to people contact. That, that's, uh, that, that's what would do the most, I think, um, given the president's limitations uh, on what he can and can't do. Although I'm not sure there are many limitations on executive action these days. <laughs> That's a discussion for another day. No, but let me press you on that. <laughs> I just have one question on that. I mean, I, I don't want you to feel uncomfortable with me asking this, but the environment in Congress, if the president takes more executive action, given the environment that, that has already been established with the reforms or uh, the measures that he's taken on immigration, it just seems like it's going to be an uphill battle to do more of that because of that. W would you agree with that? Or? I would. Okay. Uh, I, I do think it uh, becomes more difficult. Okay. okay. Um, any other questions? One here. Philip, <clears throat> Philip Brenner, American University. Uh, thank you for coming this morning, and thank you for your, all your efforts. Uh, speaking of immigration, uh, the immigration ICE uh, has reported that there's the largest number of Cubans uh, who have been uh, detained on the sea this year than in previous years, almost the beginning of another exodus of sorts, uh, dangerous. Um, one of the attractions is the Cuban Adjustment Act. Uh, and I wonder if there's any discussion among your colleagues uh, about ending the Cuban Adjustment Act. I, I will say there is discussion. Uh, but uh, no consensus in any way, and I think we're a ways from that. But there, there are discussions. Um, it's not just uh, those who are apprehended at sea, uh, those who are crossing uh, the southern border, a significant increase. And, and, uh, and so they're, they're, those discussions are happening, but we're no closer to resolution on that. Um, I have a question, a tweeted question, and I think this is going to be our last question unless Someone really has a burning uh, question to, uh, to pose. Um, Jill, would you like to? One of our followers asks, what do you think is most likely to change in the short term? Not what should, but what could. I, I still think uh, through executive action, 
um, broadening of categories or a general license for purposeful travel. It's been made more difficult by recent executive actions, but I still think that's uh, the most likely short-term uh, change. Okay. Well, I want to thank you for, for taking the time. I know I, I tried to get you before session starts uh, in the morning, so I want to thank you for coming. This has been very enlightening. Uh, thank you for sharing your impressions. Um, you know, it, it's really great to have someone as thoughtful as you on these issues. Obviously, this is an issue that is sort of stagnated, that hasn't moved. Uh, there are different uh, reasons for that, uh, but having folks that are sort of pushing the limit on both sides of the aisle is also is always very important. So I appreciate uh, what you're doing. Well, thank you. And let me just say, I look around the room. I see people who have been involved in this issue uh, that su have supported efforts that we made, uh, uh, you know, for the past 14, 15 years on this. And and uh, some who've been involved, uh, see the ambassador there for a lot longer than that. Uh, so I, I appreciate the good work of a lot of people in this room on this. Great. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So we're going to have a short break just so I can put up uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the chairs and table for the next panel. It should be about 10 minutes. And then we'll start off with uh, Elizabeth and with Robert. You know what? I'll keep. Oh, that's his. That's his. Yeah, that's his. Yeah, I'll keep mine. Do you want to help me put this down here? Do you want to help me put this down here? Yeah. Um.
turn them off.
Got it. Great. Good morning. First, I want to thank Carl and Senator Flake for the terrific presentation and add a warm welcome to Carl's on behalf of the Center for International Policy. We're delighted to have you take part in what should be a very interesting program that will try to do something different from the usual Cuba conference. Though many of us indeed feel that U.S.-Cuba relations should be normalized, we are not here to press for that or to make the case, but rather to show how it could be done if and when a U.S. president decides it is in the national interest. Typically, foreign affairs are an executive function, and Congress mostly stays out of the process, but Cuba is different. The passions it can work up in segments of this country are nothing short of extraordinary. Thus, in the mid-1990s, to an unprecedented degree, Congress began legislating specifically around Cuba with such laws as the Cuba Democracy Act of 1992 and the elaborately named Cuban Liberty and Democratic Solidarity Act of 1996, commonly known as the Helms-Burton Act. Those laws followed directly from the end of the Cold War and the disappearance of Soviet subsidies to the Cuban economy. With the subsidies gone, the Cuban economy went into free fall and it was widely predicted that popular discontent would soon sweep the government from power. This belief was so widespread that Miamians will remember neighbors with packed bags ready to return to a new Cuba. A South Florida radio station offered a prize for predicting the exact date of Fidel Castro's fall, and a prominent Miami author titled a book, Castro's Final Hour, in 1992. Members of Congress took up the idea that Castro's end could be hastened by exacerbating Cuba's distress. Thus, each of the laws passed by Congress had as a principal feature restrictions on Cuban trade and investment. Because the embargo already prohibited U.S. commerce with Cuba, the new laws were aimed at third country activity and predictably were met with protests from the EU, Canada, and Mexico. It was widely argued at the time that Congress had usurped the president's authority to make Cuba policy. This morning, a panel of experts will examine some of those laws and indicate the extent to which they diminish a president's historical perspective to, de to, de to determine U.S.-Cuba policy and consider how far a president can go to normalize relations. Robert Muse, our first speaker and the moderator, and the intellectual inspiration for this conference, is a lawyer whose work for the past 20 years has focused on U.S. laws regarding Cuba. His work is notable for, among other things, showing that Congress's attempts to strip the president of authority over the embargo largely failed that the codification provision of the Helms-Burton Act that was meant to freeze the embargo in place did only that, froze it in place. It thus less, less left untouched the president's authority through rulemaking, licensing, and other actions to determine U.S. policies relating to Cuba and Cubans. Muse's explication of the limits on congressional action involving Cuba contributed importantly to such things as the Brookings Report of 2008, which urged the next U.S. president, who turned out to be Obama, to use his executive authority to allow constructive engagement in areas of U.S. national interest, notably the restitution, restitution of people-to-people -people travel. Most recently, an article Muse wrote for America's Quarterly copies which are, of which are available here, describes presidential authority to, to engage with Cuba in such areas as basic trade and to remove some of the elements of U.S. policy that most aggrieve Cuba, including its continued president, presence on the State Department's terrorist sponsoring list and the extension of U.S. export and other controls to third country transactions with Cuba.
Today, Robert Muse has asked his panel to climb a little higher and dig a little deeper and to consider what normalized relations would actually look like and how we could get there. One day, a president will decide to pursue normalization and may find useful the legal pathway laid out here. Thank you. <clears throat> Robert Muse. Thank you. As many of you know, I think Elizabeth is the new director of uh, the CIP, Center for International Policies, Cuba program, uh, succeeding Wayne Smith, who's here this morning. But I'm pleased to tell you that Wayne stays on as senior fellow, is it, Wayne? Well, we're glad to have you remain with us. Uh, this conference uh, event had its origins in Hillary Clinton saying not long ago that she favored normalized relations with Cuba. Uh, it was one of the first times a nationally prominent political figure has used that word, normalization. Her reasoning was that the uh, current policy of embargo serves to, in her verb, prop up the government of Cuba. And if we remove the embargo, then we remove this source of uh, uh, support for the government by Cubans aggrieved at some of our policies. The uh, paper I've left on your tables deals with the first aspect of normalization of relations. I'm going to propose a three-stage continuum here. The first step is to uh, remove, take down, some of the most punitive measures directed at Cuba. They include things like uh, our extraterritorial application of our export laws, which prevented Cuba in the last year or two from buying a European Airbus because there was more than 10% US content in that aircraft. It also meant that Cuba had to go to great lengths and expense to find an oil Exploratory, exploratory rig that didn't have U.S. components above 10 percent, almost impossible in the world of deep sea drilling. Uh, so number one is the first stage is taking down the punitive elements of the embargo. Uh, stage two is what I'll call baseline normal in terms of trade and uh, specifically in terms of trade, it's uh, really economy class. That's using the uh, metaphor of air travel. Uh, you take down the punitive aspects of our current policy and we've sort of let Cuba out of the cargo hold. Now we put them into economy class, but it bears the grand title in trade terms, most favored nation. In fact, it's baseline normal. Uh, in trade terms, as Jake will discuss in a moment, uh, first class consists of free trade agreements and other such modern uh, trade protocols. But stage two is get to baseline normal. And then stage three, in which uh, our last two speakers will discuss what are, uh, stage three being best and brightest relations between nations. What do they look like? Uh, they're often characterized, in the case of US and Canada, with a free trade agreement. It also extends to Mexico. They can take the form of preferential visa treatment. We have that arrangement with EU countries. Uh, best and brightest relations will be discussed by Dan Whittle in the field of environmental cooperation and by Christine Farley who's at present at oral argument in the Supreme Court, who will talk about best relations in the fields, field of intellectual property protection. And the current instrument that governs intellectual property protections is the 1929 Inter-American Inter Convention. So we're in need of an overhaul there. Uh, since that document uh, was ratified, we have cyber issues, domain names, a range of intellectual property issues that are going to require new arrangements with Cuba. So uh, 
we'll start with Mark Feldman, and he's going to provide shape to the constitutional legal dimension of presidential power uh, to normalize relations with Cuba. I'm not going to do uh, biographic introductions. You can find those at the rear. But sufficient to say that uh, Mark was, for some time, our chief lawyer in the international affairs realm as acting and deputy legal advisor at the State Department. Uh, he will be followed by Jake Colvin, who's going to talk a bit about trade, baseline trade, and maybe a bit further. Matthew Aho will delve into the very difficult issue of bank transactions involving Cuba. You'll notice, those of you who skimmed my article, that it was too complicated for me, so I left it for him. Then <coughs> Gustavo Arnavat, who was our executive director at the Inter-American Bank not long ago, will talk about international financial uh, membership of Cuba. And then, as I say, we'll finish with Dan Whittle and Christine Farley. Mark? Thank you very much, uh, Robert. I'm very uh, honored and pleased to, to be here. Good morning to all. Um, Robert has asked me to uh, discuss as briefly as I can um, what the president can do on his own authority uh, under the Constitution and standing uh, legislation to improve our relations uh, with Cuba. <clears throat> As a teacher of foreign relations law, I know this to be a complex and uh, fluid uh, subject. Um, I'm, I'm hoping to develop a, a, a paper that we can circulate to you that will give you the jurisprudential uh, background to summarize that very briefly before moving into the, uh, the bottom line here of what we have done in the past with Cuba and what we might do in the future. Um, let me just say that um, this has been debated. The president's power as against congressional power, the conflict between the, the two of them uh, for control of U.S. foreign policy making um, dates back to the very earliest days of the republic. I think it was Alexander Hamilton and then John Marshall and finally the Supreme Court in the 30s that said while the Congress uh, uh, reigns supreme in uh, domestic affairs, the president is the uh, sole organ of the nation in dealing with foreign countries. And there is a line of uh, cases uh, that basically says when it comes to external matters, uh, the president is king. But there's a more current line of cases uh, applied uh, primarily to protect uh, economic interests, domestic economic interests, uh, uh, like the, uh, property, uh, civil liberties, and states' rights. Where, <clears throat> beginning with the uh, famous uh, steel seizure cases in the uh, Truman administration, um, the court has said that the powers of the president are not fixed, but fluctuate uh, with the powers and the implementation of the execution of those powers by Congress. Um, so that means that when we talk about traditional areas of pre presidential power, and particularly in the Cuban context, Helms-Burton casts a very long shadow, and it will, it will influence the debate. And if a case should ever come to the Supreme Court, that would certainly be something that would have to, would be, you know, of central concern. Um, just to, to recall some of the more dramatic examples of things the presidents have done on their own authority. Think about the Yalta and Potsdam agreements which reshaped uh, Europe after World War II. Think about President Truman's proclamation on the continental shelf which uh, unilaterally, without congressional authorization, extended U.S. jurisdiction over the seabed and subsoil many, many miles uh, off U.S. coasts under international waters. In the context of Cuba, uh, I personally, during my government service, participated in uh, negotiations of executive agreements on a variety of sensitive subjects. Perhaps the most interesting was the hijack, and important from a policy uh, point of view, was the uh, hijacking agreement 
which the Nixon administration negotiated as an executive agreement uh, with uh, Castro. Um, I don't have time to go into that this morning, but if there's interest, we can go into it later. I also participated in uh, negotiating um, in the Carter administration, uh, modus vivendi uh, with Cuba on uh, maritime boundaries, which we did for one year as an executive agreement. And then we did something called a maritime boundary agreement, uh, which we submitted uh, for, to the Senate for advice and consent as a treaty. But knowing that was not likely to happen, we also made an executive agreement apply under the, what we considered the executive's, the president's authority to make uh, boundary agreements, provisional boundary agreements, um, by executive authority alone. Uh, and that remains in force today uh, on the basis of um, uh, exchanges of diplomatic notes every two years. So all of these things uh, were done by executive agreement. But I would say, <clears throat> looking forward, uh, coming to our agenda for this morning, the four areas most uh, relevant uh, where the, it's clear the, tra the constitutional practice and uh, legal precedent say the president has uh, pr primary authority are in the areas of recognition and diplomatic relations, international claims, maritime boundaries, and law enforcement. All of these areas are potential uh, avenues for some uh, progress on relations with Cuba. Beginning uh, with diplomatic relations, President Eisenhower um, suspended diplomatic relations and closed the embassy way back on January 3, 1961. But that action did not affect U.S. recognition of the caste of the communist regime in Cuba. The United States has long before that date and to this very day, the United States has consistently recognized uh, the Castro regime as the de jure regime uh, of, of uh, the de jure government uh, of Cuba. This same thing applies in Iran, uh, where we have not had diplomatic relations since the seizure of the embassy back in 1979. The United States has always recognized uh, the current regime as the de jure government uh, of Iran. Under the Constitution, the president, under Article Two, the president has plenary authority. We, at least we in the executive branch, always believed, uh, when it comes to matters of recognition, and normal and the uh, suspension and/or renewal of um, diplomatic uh, relations. Um, way back in 1933, FDR established unilaterally, uh, unilaterally established relations with the Soviet Union and made a comprehensive claim settlement by executive agreement. Jimmy Carter did the same thing with China in uh, 1979. Uh, a few years, well, almost in, in the same general time frame, he made an agreement, uh, a claim settlement agreement with uh, the Ayatollah uh, in um, in uh, Iran. The, uh, so it's my conclusion that it is a matter of executive discretion. The president could um, formalize our relations, replace the uh, interest section with an embassy, restore the embassy. Now, the Senate doesn't have to confirm a nominee uh, uh, for ambassador, if, they, if there should be a problem there, the president uh, can run the embassy by appointing a, a charge d'affaires, um, but the, the uh, executive does need appropriated funds to run the embassy, so there, you know, can't say there is no congressional oversight of, uh, of this matter. Um, historically, resumption of diplomatic relations with communist regimes has been linked with an executive agreement providing a comprehensive claims settlement. Because both countries typically want such linkage, the U.S. to obtain compensation for American claimants, the other government 
to terminate or avoid uh, litigation in U.S. courts. Uh, the pattern with the Soviet Union, with Eastern Europe, with China, was very limited compensation, maybe 30 cents on the dollar or less uh, for American claimants, paid out of foreign assets, the foreign government's assets frozen in the United States. These uh, executive agreements, based on the president's sole authority, have been upheld by the Supreme Court as the supreme law of the land. Now, Congress in, uh, I think section uh, 204, is it, in the Helms Burden, um, it's 207. This is a very curious provision sense of Congress. It is the sense of the Congress that a satisfactory res resolution of property claims by a Cuban government recognized by the United States remains an essential condition for the full resumption of economic and diplomatic relations between the United States and Cuba. One, do they wonder, do they not know that we already recognize uh, the government in uh, Havana? I don't know. But this is sense of the Congress. The Congress has not made this a, it has not attempted to make, to dictate uh, as a matter of law uh, this policy. Uh, may, maybe this is recognition on Congress's part that this is a matter of presidential discretion uh, under uh, Article Two, perhaps. Um, the, uh, we have a more fundamental problem, though, when it comes to uh, uh, negotiating a claims agreement w with Cuba. There isn't enough money. Uh, the, the claims amount to billions of dollars. The frozen assets are very limited. Um, it's hard to imagine Cuba appropriating money uh, to pay American claimants. Um, so is there another option? I think there could be, if U.S. Uh, sanctions uh, were relaxed, and if the Cubans were prepared to create the right opportunities for a private investment, uh, American entities with large claims against Cuba might be able to recoup some of their losses through new investment. But absent a comprehensive claims to settle, uh, settlement, the investors would have to worry about political risk both in the United States and in Cuba. Big problem. Uh, what could the president do on his own authority? Robert asked me to focus on this, and it's my conclusion that the president could not make an exec, in, do on his own authority an executive agreement which looks like a traditional bilateral investment treaty because that exposes the United States government the Treasury to reciprocal liability for Cuban claims. Uh, but that doesn't mean he can't negotiate a framework uh, agreement. I think the President does have authority uh, to negotiate an executive, a formal executive agreement with Cuba, which would pro provide a framework for Cuban guarantees to American investors who voluntarily subscribed uh, to the terms of these arrangements. Um, uh, that agreement could spell out the protections Cuba is prepared to offer. It could provide impartial dispute settlement. It could even provide funding uh, for the, uh, uh, let's say, a uh, claims tribunal. It could provide funding for, uh, not just for the expenses, but it could provide uh, funding uh, for um, the awards, if any had to be issued. Um, where would the money come from? It could come from contributions from Cuba and from the investors. Um, com uh, commercial insurance, political risk insurance, uh, could play uh, a role in this. I've done that in private practice uh, uh, for, some in for some clients. Um, there is a, a quasi precedent, not directly in point, not going quite this far, but uh, in the Clinton administration, the, uh, the, the, the executive negotiated an agreement with Germany and with other uh, countries uh, in Europe relating to Holocaust claims. 
and these agreements, which were binding on the two governments, uh, provided in the case of Germany, for the, the Germans to, to fund uh, uh, claims pool that would then be distributed by a, an impartial process uh, created under that agreement. Um, in this particular case, the Supreme Court held that a, Calis a California statute uh, that was it deemed inconsistent uh, with the policy of that agreement it was unconstitutional. There was the, the, the executive agreement, which really didn't have any rules of decision for the courts in it. It was a policy document from as far as United States law is concerned, was held to be supreme, the supreme law of the land under Article VI binding uh, on the states. A, a very interesting uh, precedent, but it was a five to four uh, decision. In conclusion, and I am running out of time here, I want to sound one note of caution on this question of presidential power and congressional power. As we speak, and this came up earlier, the nation is deeply divided over President Obama's actions on immigration. And the Supreme Court is about to decide, the case has already been argued, whether the president can disregard a statute allowing an American citizen born in Jerusalem to insist on a U.S. passport that describes his a place of birth as Jerusalem. Such a statement in a formal diplomatic communication would be inconsistent with long established uh, U.S. recognition policy um, since the time of Harry Truman. Every administration since uh, Harry Truman's recognition of Israel has adopted the position that the status of Jerusalem remains to be determined uh, by negotiation of the parties in the area. At oral argument, however, the court was sharply divided on ideological grounds. Contrary to traditional expectations, the conservative justices were strongly resistant to the government's foreign policy concern. The liberals were supportive. The justices also directed a surprising amount of attention to current events in the Middle East. It was a very interesting day to be in court. We have to wait for the decision, but my worry is that the political divisions that we have now and will have in the coming years between a Democratic president and a Republican Congress might be reflected in a more political judicial process than we have ever seen uh, that could influence constitutional jurisprudence in coming years. We'll just have to see. Thank you, Mark. Uh, I, I want to make a brief comment about executive authority. Senator Flake brought it up. Uh, when this event was conceived, uh, there was no uh, premonition that Barack Obama was going to use executive powers to at least regularize five million uh, people in the United States. Does this bleed over into executive action over Cuba? Uh, to some extent, but I would argue not greatly. Foreign relations are a reserved area of presidential prerogative. This has been true for, as uh, Mark said, for 200 years. Uh, bold endeavors by presidents are necessary in foreign relations. When uh, Richard Nixon made the decision to normalize relations with Cuba, that was not subject to a national referendum. It's something that Historically, great discretion has been reposed in the president. Number two, uh, immigration, of course, is a domestic issue, and this is extremely controversial. Uh, Cuba, if it figures at all in the daily thoughts of most Americans, it never reaches uh, probably two on a scale of 100 in issues of great concern. So not only is the public not much interested in the issue of Cuba, but on balance, most polls would show broad support for normalizing relations with Cuba. So I take the point, and I take Mark's final point particularly to heart, that we live in an ever more politicized environment where there are uh, raids into one another's 
constitutionally allocated authority, both by Congress and the executive, and uh, not surprisingly in recent, this has always been true, uh, the Supreme Court periodically legislates and performs executive functions, whether they'll admit it or not. Uh, Carl, should we go to questions or keep going? Should we go to the next? Yeah, so we'll reserve questions for uh, Jake, uh, Vice President, National Foreign Trade Council. Thank you. Um, thank you to Carl and CSIS, uh, to CIP, uh, and also to Bob. You know, Bob's been, uh, is an expert in this field and has been um, providing a lot of advice for us and for me personally on Cuba issues, and so I really appreciate all of that. Uh, for those of you who don't know the National Foreign Trade Council, we're a trade association based here in Washington, D.C. We promote open markets and international trade on behalf of uh, our multinational member companies. We run the USA Engage Coalition, which promotes economic and diplomatic engagement in the world, uh, and which holds up U.S.-Cuba policy as uh, the greatest example of failed unilateral U.S. sanctions policy. Um, I wanted to make uh, three brief points here today. The first is that uh, authority exists for the president to permit additional two-way trade with Cuba, to discuss how a president might go about using that authority in the short term, uh, and to emphasize that uh, the long-term trade relationship will depend on a lot more than altering or lifting sanctions policy. So on the first, I think policymakers and practitioners uh, dating back to the Clinton administration, but even more so over the past four to five years, uh, have done a great job in laying the intellectual basis for the idea that the authority exists for the president uh, to uh, license additional exports and imports to and from Cuba. Uh, so when I was writing a paper a couple of years ago on executive authority, I interviewed the, um, Serena Mo, who is uh, a former OFAC deputy general counsel, and she said, Helms Burton left in place the ability to issue regulations and licenses, either general or specific. If that weren't the case, no little leaguers could go to Cuba and no aid could be given to Cuba without an act of Congress. And I think more recently, Bob, in, in the article that you have before you, does a good job of laying out the argument that the president has executive authority to license trade. Um, I, I think so then second, how would the president go about using that authority in the short term? Uh, the most elegant solution would be uh, for the president to um, rip off the Band-Aid all at once uh, and allow uh, Cuban imports uh, and license to, to license Cuban imports and exports sort of all at once and to get back to that, I think what Bob referred to as baseline normalcy of uh, most favored nation treatment. I think that's unlikely given the history of U.S.-Cuba relationship, which has been at best incremental. Um, I think the reality will be in the short term, uh, more incremental steps will be taken, um, and I'd like to suggest maybe just one here. And so my suggestion would be for the Treasury Department to grant licenses for e-commerce platforms like eBay and Etsy uh, and payment services like PayPal and Visa to enable Cuban nationals, wherever they're located in the world, uh, to sell on platforms uh, to customers that include the uh, U.S. citizens. This would be a wedge to enable Cuban entrepreneurs to engage the U.S. marketplace. And I think it's not only a good step for U.S. trade policy, but it also would help to reframe the debate about Internet access in Cuba that um, we talked, that Senator Flake talked about earlier. You know, what, we've, what I've seen, um, and one of the things that I do is I run a project at NFTC called the Global Innovation Forum that engages entrepreneurs in conversations about the global marketplace. And what we've seen is that Technology-enabled businesses, those that are connected to the Internet grow faster. Almost 100% of them engage in, uh, in the global marketplace as opposed to just locally. Uh, and that reliable Internet access propels economic development on, on a very micro level of firms of, and individual entrepreneurs of just two or three people. Um, and so finally, I, I think you know, short-term moves aside, the long-term opportunity will depend more uh, than an end to sanctions or, or a significant uh, exemption from sanctions for, for imports and exports. You know, shutting off sanctions isn't like turning on a spigot for foreign investment and trade. And, and I think longer term, the extent of trade and investment that occurs will depend on three things. Uh, the first is economic development. And so trade will rise as GDP and, and disposable incomes rise. Uh, second is the policies of the Cuban government. And so if you're going to trade with Cuba, same as if you're going to invest with Cuba, uh, you're going to care about their customs facilities and procedures, uh, their imp import permit requirements, the extent and reliability of Internet access, uh, the extent and reliability of domestic infrastructure, roads and things like that, tariffs, 
transparency and ease of doing business, their ability and willingness to protect intellectual property rights, which I think we'll hear about in a little bit. Uh, and my sense is that Cuba doesn't always score high on, in all of these areas. Uh, and in part, I, I think that's probably due to a lingering ambivalence about its relationship to the global economy. Uh, and so if you're not sure that you want to engage in the global economy, you're probably not going to do a good job trading it. Uh, and then the last thing that I think it depends on are the attitudes of the U.S. and Cuban governments. Um, a closer trade relationship will require more than a thaw. It's not enough to just stop, to decide that you're going to stop being enemies. Uh, trade deals are often as much about reflecting um, political alliances as about economics, if you look at, say, the case of U.S. and Vietnam. Um, so I think, you, you know, you could get pretty quickly back to this baseline normalcy with most favored nation status. But if you want a closer relationship, um, that requires uh, maybe not friendship, but certainly um, a mutual decision that you want better diplomatic relations as well. Just to give you, and maybe I'll end with um, just an example of how this worked um, mechanically with Vietnam. Uh, in 2001, the United States and Vietnam signed a bilateral investment treaty. Uh, in 2007, the two countries signed a trade investment framework agreement, which is essentially a precursor to a full-fledged trade agreement. And right now, the United States and Vietnam are negotiating a full-fledged trade agreement um, called the Trans-Pacific Partnership with other countries in the Asia-Pacific. Now, all of that was preceded by a fundamental rebalancing of the U.S.-Vietnamese relationship. I, I think in Cuba's case, as Mark pointed out, the ability to negotiate investment pr um, provisions are implicated as well by, by claim settlement issues, and so it makes it even more difficult. Um, but I think, you know, just deciding that if the U.S. government decides one day that the embargo has run its course and the president decides to use the authority that he or she has to change uh, the trading relationship, that doesn't necessarily mean we're going to be like the U.S. and Vietnam or the U.S. and the Dominican Republic overnight. Uh, that's going to take a lot of time. So thank you. Thank you, Jake. Uh, on to Matthew, whom I first met at the Council of Americas when he was doing some of the most uh, interesting work on the intricacies of telecommunications, banking, and so on. Matthew? Thanks, Bob. Um, thank you, CSIS um, and the other groups that are involved in putting this together. Uh, Bob gave me the complicated task of trying to discuss um, banking and financial services related issues. Um, I'd like to begin by saying that this, this issue, the issue of banking and financial services, uh, in my opinion, really needs to be pushed to the very front of the line um, if we're going to approach anything close to normal, uh, regardless of White House policy. Uh, since 2009, as we all know, President Obama has taken several executive actions unilaterally uh, to increase contact between Americans and Cubans by promoting uh, Cuban-American travel. Obviously, the flow of remittances from Cuba to the United States has grown dramatically. Um, he's attempted to increase the free flow of information uh, to the Cuban people by authorizing U.S. telecoms companies to negotiate things like international roaming agreements uh, and also internet communications technologies. For example, uh, as of 2011, it's been legal uh, for Cubans in Cuba to sign on to a <coughs> Wi-Fi connection and use uh, GChat or Microsoft Chat Messengers. Another pillar has been the uh, a desire to try to support uh, Cuban entrepreneurs in the rise of uh, uh, private economic activity in Cuba. Uh, this involves allowing Americans to send money to the island uh, as well as to engage in training programs and other things. <clears throat> Regardless of all of these, uh, the executive intent here, uh, the fundamental issue is that to sustain all these activities, um, it's required uh, that providers such as uh, travel service providers that sell airline tickets or carrier service providers that uh, handle charter flights have the ability to access uh, basic financial services, bank accounts, uh, to engage in wire transfers. Um, and without this, it's really impossible for the White House to actually implement uh, its, pol its policies regardless of intent. So to just give you a sense of, of where we stand right now, and this is still relatively new, but it's happening as we, as we speak. Um, the groups, uh, everything from diplomatic missions to companies authorized to sell plane tickets, are having an increasing uh, 
problem accessing even basic banking services. Uh, I'll, I'll run through some examples that are actually happening right now. Um, I have a client uh, who, about four or five months ago, uh, got a letter from his bank in the southeast United States. He'd had a relationship with this bank for about 30 years. Um, he is a remittance forwarder. He's licensed by OFAC to engage in, in, in activities. In fact, he is you know, the, one of the companies that makes it possible for the White House to carry out its policies of sending money to Cuba. Uh, he got a letter out of the blue, and it gave him 10 days to close all of his bank accounts. They didn't give an opportunity to appeal it. It was just, you have 10 days to close your accounts. We appreciate your 30-year relationship with us, but uh, we've decided as a matter of bank policy that we're not going to bank remittance forwarders of any kind anymore. About a year ago, I think it's more than a year now, um, the Cuban interest section in Washington, D.C. here announced that um, it was going to have to cancel consular services at its interest section because um, it had been dro dropped by its bank in, in upstate New York. Again, this is a bank that had a relationship going on with, uh, you know, providing this, this licensed activity for 30 plus years, uh, but as a matter of bank policy, the bank decided we're not going to bank diplomatic missions at all. The result was briefly uh, a collapse of, of people to people travel, uh, and even now, I have clients who are trying to get uh, visas to go to visit uh, gravely ill family members who have been unable to get those, those visas because the, the, the payment system is, uh, is, is so difficult. Uh, I have clients who have called and asked me whether it would be possible for them to drop a quarter of a million dollars in cash at the interest section in an armored truck here in Washington because they couldn't get a wire transfer to go through. The answer to the question, you know, it's, the, 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 I mean, it's almost absurd that these questions are arising, but these are the things that people are, are asking. Um, and it's not at all uncommon at this point for, uh, for companies to be operating almost on a cash basis. Oh, no. um, so the Cuban interest section is another example. And then lastly, this is one of my personal favorites. It came in a couple weeks ago. I got a panicked phone call from a client who has a license to engage in people-to-people -people, uh, activities uh, because a wire transfer from North Carolina to the Northeast United States uh, was being held up. No one knew where or how, but being held up. It didn't arrive uh, because we were told uh, the word Cuba was in, in, in on the actual SWIFT wire transfer instructions. These banks have automated systems. They screen the words. They see the word Cuba, bingo. You know, you've got your wire, your, your wire blocked. Uh, but the issue was, <laughs> this is not a transaction that was ever subject to U.S. sanctions. This is a transaction going from a, from a nonprofit organization in one state in the United States to a nonprofit organization in another state in the United States um, getting held up. And I know of an organization. Go on to yeah, yeah. So, um, the bottom line of all the, the anecdotes is to just inject the, the element of, uh, of perceived risk by banks. If banks perceive um, uh, the risks to be too high to deal with uh, a, a, an account holder that has an OFAC license or a company that's trying to send money to purchase uh, an import from Cuba or an export from the United States uh, to Cuba, uh, it doesn't matter what the White House decides to do because you know, at the end, it's not going to, where the rubber hits the road, there are going to be uh, a lot of roadblocks. So I want to move along quickly, but the, the, the idea that um, banks are, are dealing and grappling with these risks and that these, these risks have become more complex um, is new, it's growing, um, and there has to be a way to reduce perceived risks. Um, the bottom line, if licensed entities can't um, access banking services, White House policies will be undercut. I don't want to get into the risk discussion too much because it's very multidimensional, it's difficult, and banks evaluate risk differently. It's quite subjective. Uh, needless to say, the, 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 the basic legal and regulatory risk is at the, is at the center of this. Um, the state and federal regulations uh, and OFAC compliance regulations um, are complex. They require 
a tremendous amount of expense on the part of organizations that are trying to en engage in licensed activities. Um, compliance is costly, and failure to, to, to comply, even if it's you know, a, a, a mistake on a wire transfer instruction, uh, can lead to uh, tremendous fines, uh, millions if not even in some cases billions of dollars of fines. Uh, this um, potential uh, risk, the risk of being fined a billion dollars or more, um, has the effect of, um, of really throwing off kilter the, the risk-reward balance that banks uh, in the U.S. and, and overseas are, are, are facing. Uh, if, um, you know, the, the accounts are probably quite small, the, uh, the, you know, the profit from engaging in these activities isn't high, and if the potential risk is billions, you're just going to decline the business. Um, so anyway, in, in terms of reduction, uh, we've been talking a lot and thinking a lot about, well, how do we reduce the risk to banks? If, if this is going to really gum up the works, how do we you know, make things move, move more smoothly? Uh, we don't, I don't have an answer for it. I don't think anyone has a full answer. We've sit around you know, debating this recently quite a bit. Uh, but we do know that there are certain steps that the president can take that would, cert would, would go a long way to helping. Uh, I know we don't discuss the merits of any individual policy decision at, at this forum, uh, but let's begin with the state sponsors of terrorism list. Um, when dealing with a, a sanctioned entity, uh, banks are already assigning a pretty high level of risk to that entity. Uh, that can be, you know, a Syrian militia or North Korea or what have you. If you're if you're if you're sanctioned, that's high. Um, banks are grappling with a whole variety of other uh, issues: counterterrorism, any money laundering, etc. But when you add uh, a state sponsor of terror to this web uh, of uh, of perceived risk. It really is, I think, in many cases, the straw that breaks the camel's back, and um, and it's you know a banking executive can simply point at it and say we're not going to deal with state sponsors of terrorism. Um, so that's one place to begin. Uh, another is 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 uh, clarity from the White House about what its policies are and 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 a desire to see its policies implemented and carried out. Um, I think there can be a, certainly rhetorical. Uh, you know, the, the administration can be more vocal about saying, we want people-to-people -people travel to be happening, we want remittances to be happening, and those businesses that are involved in sending funds that are licensed and legal are not and should not be punished by federal agencies. Um, and um, so I think, you know, and, 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 in, and injecting a degree of, of discretion, prosecutorial discretion and clarity uh, at the enforcement level. Um, so, you know, these are a few, it's complicated, I look forward to questions, um, but the bottom line, uh, obviously, it's in the mutual benefit of the U.S. government, banks, account holders, companies that are engaged in, act in these activities to collaborate to find uh, solutions, and current and future policies toward Cuba cannot effectively be implemented in the current risk environment. There has to be something done to address it. Thank you. Uh I think it's now's a good point to go to questions, and then we'll resume with Gustavo. Uh, Christine, welcome aboard. Thank you. Uh, and Dan. So uh, how do you want to handle that? Pass your microphone? Yeah, if, if folks have questions, just raise your hand, and, and we'll get to you with a microphone. There's one over there with the gentleman with the glasses. John McAuliffe, Fund for Reconciliation and Development. Um, Mr. Feldman, two specific. Uh, legislatively, um, there was a move, and I don't know how it's, what control it has, to say that people who are now U.S. citizens, Cubans who have become U.S. citizens, retroactively were covered by whatever exists for American citizen property in Cuba. How f much of a factor is that? The second is whether within this parameter of presidential authority, the president could announce tomorrow that everything that is produced by the non-state sector in Cuba was exempted from the embargo, and every purchase by the non-state sector, that is co-ops as well as self-employed, uh, whether that was raw materials, machine tools, 
technical advice that that also could be exempted from the embargo. Would those specific things be within presidential authority? Well, I would defer to Robert on the, the technical details there. My understanding on the first uh, point is that Helms-Burton, which uh, provides a framework for assessment of uh, claims uh, against Cuba, that that extends to um, claims by that would not have traditionally been recognized as as claims for which the United States was diplomatically responsible. That is to say, uh, uh, the United, that uh, a t let's say, for example, there was a taking by the Cuban government of property of Cuban nationals in Cuba. Historically, uh, the United States government would not be, rep and then that person migrated to the United States. Historically, the United States government would not represent that person. Uh, diplomatically. The, uh, the uh, question, uh, the second question uh, relates to whether the, you know, the broader question that Robert has addressed, uh, uh, and that is the premise, as I understand it, of our discussion about Helms Burton is that the president has authority to modify the regulations, and presumably that would impl implicate an incremental uh, adjustment and not a comprehensive adjustment, that that would raise much more difficult questions under Helms-Burton. Uh, I'm not prepared to address that broader question today, but maybe Robert does. In, in the handout, I, I talk about trade. Under current regulations, all imports from Cuba are prohibited. It's a specific section of the Cuban asset control regulations. But the president can amend that and has in areas like allowing uh, Cuban medical products to come into the U.S. The problem is, if you, you could do it wholesale, you could do it incrementally in the case of non-state uh, producers in Cuba, or you could do it wholesale. But you run into problems of tariffs pretty quickly because unless the president goes further and establishes most favored nation trade status with Cuba, any Cuban import would be subject to uh, the old tariff schedules. They're still in effect, but apply to very, very few countries. And they're very odd. Something like, and they reflect trade union and different sectoral interests over many, many years. Uh, wrought iron is subject to something like the full value, the, the duty you pay if you bring it into the U.S., without most favored nation treatment, is the full value of the wrought iron plus a 300% duty. It uh, clearly keeps it out. I looked at this in relation to some of Cuban exports at one point. Uh, things like uh, agricultural products usually get pretty uh, decent tariff treatment. Things that many people are interested in, uh, potentially, rum, cigars, and Cuban beer, I think the duty on Cuban beer would be something like five cents a liter, so it's negligible. But you do have to walk, cherry pick your way through to determine imports into the U.S. that could meet the duty requirements that arise from non-most favored nation treatment. Jake may have something to add to this or not. I, but we can go to uh, Jake wisely uh, has stepped out of it. Back here, I'll hold on. Peter Kornblum, National Security Archive. Uh, thank you for the speakers so far. Looking forward to the next several. Um, for, um, for Matthew and Robert, what are, the, in, what are the sanctions that relate to banking that are specific to the terrorism list? Uh, and do those go away if Cuba's taken off the list? And what are the issues about banking that remain with the embargo overall in Helms-Burton? I, I think it's an excellent question. I've tried to work this out. Matthew's gone further into this wilderness than anyone who's survived to tell the tale. Uh, I think if you take Cuba off the terror sponsoring list, many, many things devolve off of that, including the ability to sue the nation of Cuba 
and that's created judgments against Cuba becoming more and more complicating. Uh, it also requires certain OFAC licensing because they're on the terrorist list. And if you violate an OFAC regulation, the downside is very, very heavy. So if you take them off the list, I think you make substantial progress in reducing legal risk, but also attitudinally changing uh, how banks are viewing this. Because uh, do you want to be the bank? There was a case recently in New York where uh, victims of a rocket attack in Israel sued a bank and claimed the bank should have known that one of its account holders actually was a front for Hamas and they had provided the money to fire the rocket. So by being on the terror sponsoring list just in clouds Cuba in uh, suspicion and mistrust. Now Matthew can give you a fuller answer. No, I mean, I fully agree with Bob on this. I mean, another interesting example, I, and I think that ad, attitudinally or politically, um, the, we, we saw recently, several months back, uh, a client was a, a Midwest uh, bank based in Minneapolis, and uh, they had carved out a niche uh, uh, becoming a remittance forwarder, not for Cuba, uh, but for Somalia, because of the large Somali community uh, in Minneapolis, St. Paul. Uh, similar to Cuba, they operate, uh, they operate with an OFAC license. Um, and issues affecting remittance forwarders generally, uh, and this is to anywhere, because the law requires not only that a bank know its customers, but in many cases its customers' customers. And that, that's a very high threshold for banks to reach. Uh, in the case of, 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 uh, of, of, of this uh, bank, uh, they were fully compliant with OFAC for years, uh, sending remittances to, to Somali on behalf of Somali uh, folks in Minneapolis. And um, OFAC, of course, had provided all the necessary clearances. Uh, one day, they received a letter from uh, the local, uh, it was a local officer from the Justice Department, uh, completely different agency, uh, than OFAC inquiring about, uh, about their activities and, and inquiring about you know, a variety of different anti-money laundering and counterterrorism uh, issues. Uh, and rather, of course, than face scrutiny uh, from the Justice Department for this, they shut down remittances for a period. At which point, uh, one of their local representatives quickly uh, uh, became very vocal uh, in the House um, and cobbled together, I think, what, what became an effective uh, political and bureaucratic solution to the problem. In other words, there were representatives of Congress that were willing to take on this cause, uh, stand with uh, the, 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 the bank, and you know, they were able to at least put it together a stopgap measure. The point being, uh, Somalia is not a state sponsor of terrorism. It's easier to get representatives to, to, to apply political pressure to, to, to search for solutions uh, if you don't have that label. And it's a, it's a starting point. We, 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 it's, we, we can't, perceived risk by, by the banks is, is, is very complicated. It's hard to get to the bottom of it. But what we do know, it's like an onion. We do know that the state sponsor of terrorism, I think if you take that, that last layer off, it'll allow us to begin to get to some of the, the finer points and the other issues that are there. I think we can move on to the next segment if you'd like. Is there another question? I think not. No, I guess not. No, no. Uh, on to Gustavo, who's going to talk about the Inter-American Bank, and then from there we're Thank you, Bob. Let me, let me start off by underscoring something that um, Carl and Elizabeth mentioned at the beginning of their interventions, which is that the purpose of this conference is not to talk about whether or not the United States should try to normalize relations with, uh, with Cuba. Uh, I was specifically asked to talk about, under current U.S. law and under the charters of the various international financial institutions, what is uh, possible. Uh, I, for one, don't see uh, it, uh, I don't think it's realistic at all that there would be, in the near term, certainly any kind of uh, effort by the United States to try to normalize relations. I certainly don't see any kind of a unilateral lifting on the part of the United States uh, of the executive to the full extent uh, possible or, or certainly with the, uh, with the uh, consent of the Congress uh, to lift that embargo anytime uh, soon um, for a number of different reasons, the, uh, not the least of which is that I believe that uh, Cuba has, for a number of years, held the key 
to a better relationship uh, with the United States, and it has chosen not to, despite protestations to the contrary, has chosen not to exercise uh, that key. Uh, Bob did mention that Secretary Clinton, in her book, uh, questioned the usefulness of the embargo, but she also correctly pointed out that at various times in the history of the United States vis-a-vis -vis Cuba, uh, when the United States has gotten close to doing certain things, uh, importantly, under the, uh, under the um, administration of her, of her husband, uh, Cuba would take, you know, when we were getting close, Cuba would do certain things that would make, make it at least politically very difficult for the executive to, to move on. Uh, and so this is all by way of saying that, you know, it really, it takes two to tango. Uh, when this, the Cuban context, it takes two to salsa. Um, and so, and the reason I mention this is because regardless of whatever the law provides or the charters provide, as I'll explain uh, in a minute, um, one cannot ignore the political, diplomatic, and strategic context in which any of these actions would, would take place. Now, let me move on. Uh, Helms Burden, I'm gonna talk about uh, the prohibitions or limitations under Helms Burden, as well as the various charters of the various international financial institutions, such as the World Bank, uh, the IDB or the, the IMF, although because of my background having worked at the IDB, uh, I will focus primarily on, on the IDB. Helms Burton is a law that uh, to a surprising degree uh, ties the hands of the executive in, its, uh, in the bilateral relationship between the United States uh, and Cuba, bilateral and also multilateral. Section 104 of that act specifically deals with the membership of Cuba in any of those international financial institutions that I mentioned. And it requires that until the president uh, certifies that Cuba has a democratic government, it requires the Secretary of Treasury, uh, which is who is the governor of any of these institutions, the governor on the behalf of the United States, to instruct the United States executive directors at these institutions to vote against Cuba's membership. Now, what's curious about that language is that the executive directors uh, at these institutions have nothing to do with Cuba's membership or the membership of any, of any country in these institutions. It's actually the governor himself or herself uh, that would vote uh, because this is a decision that's taken at the governor's level. So what do we make of this? Uh, you know, if we are to construe section 104 narrowly uh, or literally, uh, then it is inoperative, right? It just doesn't make any sense. It just, it's, a, it's a useless uh, provision in the term because, like I said, the U.S. executive directors would never be involved uh, in deciding whether or not uh, Cuba or any other country can become a member of, the, um, uh, of those institutions. They certainly, in preparation for the possibility of membership of Cuba or anyone, anyone else, they certainly would work uh, behind the scenes and at meetings, et cetera, uh, but at the end of the day, it's up to the governors to make that determination. Now, if this issue were litigated, uh, I suppose that a good argument could be made that the intention of the drafters of Helms Burton uh, was that what they really meant uh, was for the governor uh, to vote against Cuba joining uh, these institutions. Uh, and I will leave it up to others and litigators to decide, you know, which way that would, that would uh, uh, how that would be decided. Uh, but, but I just want to point out that's the specific uh, uh, that's what the language under Section 104 uh, of, the, of Helms Burton. Now, let's as assume that we have a broad interpretation. Let's assume that uh, what was really meant and what everyone agrees is that the governors should exercise uh, their authority to vote against Cuba becoming a member. If Cuba wanted to become a member of the IFC, uh, the World Bank, um, at least those two institutions, uh, the, sorry, the IMF or the IFC or the World Bank, and I'll deal with the IDB uh, separately. Um, and if you wanted to do that, and a majority of, of the other countries wanted Cuba to join, uh, then there's actually, uh, even with the U.S. governor uh, voting against Cuba's membership, um, there's actually very little the United States could do at, at, a, at a practical level. At, at that level, okay? Uh, in the case of the IDB, it's a little bit different because although, and by the way, just like at the, just like at the World Bank and the IMF, uh, it takes a simple majority, also at the IDB, a simple majority of the governors, of the shares represented by those governors, in the case of the, of the IMF, the quota is represented by the, by the governors uh, to vote in favor of membership of one, of one country or, or another. However, there's an interesting wrinkle in the case of the IDB 
which is that the quorum requirements for meetings of the ID, of IDB governors requires that 75 percent of the shares be represented for a quorum. Because the United States owns 30 percent of the bank, the United States could deny a quorum for any such meeting. And so effectively, the United States has a veto in the case of the IDB of Cuba joining. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it would, it's, I would have a difficult time imagining a situation where every other country wants Cuba to become a member except the United States. And they call for a governor's meeting, and everyone you know, comes to Washington, wherever it is, where this meeting should take place, and the United States simply doesn't show up. It's just something that is so unlikely to happen that we can dismiss it as even a possibility, you know, quite frankly. So again, when it comes to the IDB, the United States does have an effective veto of Cuba becoming a, a member. Um, now, um, this assumes, as I said, under that scenario, under the hypothetical, that a majority of other countries would want Cuba to become a member. Um, now, Section 104 of helms burden also provides that in a case where Cuba is a member and a loan or other uh, assistance is provided to Cuba contrary to the vote of the U.S. representative, let's say in this case it would be the U.S. executive director, let's say at the IDB, then what the law requires the Treasury Department to do is to cut back Cuba's contributions to the capital of the bank by an amount equivalent to the value of that loan or assistance. So say it's a $10 million loan to Cuba to do whatever, uh, the U.S. government opposes that. If the United States has capital, uh, paid in capital contributions that are due, under helms Burton, the Treasury is supposed to hold back that $10 million when it makes its next capital contribution or before it, 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 before, before it, it uh, finishes making all these capital contributions. If capital contributions are not due and payable, or there simply there are no uh, paid-in portions of capital that have to be paid, then it goes to the callable capital. And what that means, without getting into much into the weeds, is that um, whatever the callable capital obligation of the United States is uh, under the last capital increase, it would be cut back by $10 million, using that example. The reason I'm mentioning this is because this is a consideration that I think other countries would have to consider. Uh, in allowing Cuba to become a member or not. More broadly, and this is, I think, where we get into the practical issues, is that if there's ever the need, as I'm sure there will be, on the part of any of these uh, multilateral invest uh, development banks uh, to have a capital uh, increase, under U.S. law, the Congress has to approve any such uh, increases in capital because U.S. law protects uh, the, uh, against the illusion of the U.S. interest in any of these institutions. Other countries who are members of these institutions, certainly at IDB, are aware of this, and that's a, that's a consideration that they have to take uh, into, uh, they have to think about what, in, in connection with uh, allowing Cuba to become uh, a member. Um, I don't know how much time, Bob, I have. Uh, all right, let me, let me end there, and I'm happy to come back uh, to uh, either deepen these issues or continue talking sure. about under the chart of the IDB, the way that would work. Uh, and also the pros and cons of Cuba becoming a member of any of these institutions. Gustavo, could you finish with uh, a brief comment on what the advantages to Cuba would be and potentially the United States if they were to join the Inter-American Bank? So again, this assumes that we have the right, the right conditions uh, in place and now Cuba becomes a member of the ADB. Um, the benefits are huge. Uh, Cuba will have uh, uh, access to capital on um, very cheap terms. They'll have access to phenomenal technical assistance, uh, access to grants. Uh, also, it's important to point out the convening authority of an institution like the IDB that is so highly regarded uh, in the region. I think uh, uh, the IDB could put together uh, a phenomenal investor conference, bring in investors, consultants, and others uh, to look at possibilities of investing in Cuba. Now, on the flip side, Cuba, uh, as any other member, would have to subject itself to the conditions uh, imposed by the IDB in connection with all these loans. And these are fairly rigorous. Uh, well, there are many of these, uh, but in general, the IDB wants to make sure that it gets paid back, um, which is always gonna be risky with a, with a country like, like Cuba. Um, there is a possibility that Cuba, if it were to enter the IDB, would join a number of countries under something called the Funds for Special Operations, or the FSO, which is a separate capital base, separate from the ordinary capital of the bank, uh, the reserve for those countries that have the greatest needs. Um, Nicaragua, for example, is one of them. Guyana, Honduras, 
uh, or, uh, these uh, in, uh, countries. Now, the, a practical question is that whether those countries would raise any concerns about Cuba joining the FSO uh, at a time when those resources, of course, are, are limited. I don't see that happening without the FSO being replenished in order to allow that. It would certainly, I think, be unfair to the other countries. And then you get into the question about the Congress, of course, having to agree to that kind of replenishment. And whether or not that can happen just depends on what else is going on you know, at that time and our budget deficits, et cetera. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next, we go to Christine Haight Farley. She's going to talk about, sorry? I thought we would end with Dan. Uh, who's going to talk about the environment. Uh, Christine, I would uh, refer you to the biographies for the depth and scope of her scholarship in the area of intellectual property, but also to her great credit, she's practiced law. She's now a professor <laughs> at American University. Thank you, I'm delighted to be here. Um, I understand that the intersection of people who have a sophisticated Cuba policy understanding and a sophisticated intellectual property policy understanding uh, is very small, and I don't see that person in the room. Uh, so I'm going to, and I don't have a sophisticated understanding of Cuba policy. Um, so that being said, I'm going to kind of rapidly run through uh, what I have identified as some of the major issues, um, and I'm sorry I can't give you the full landscape, uh, nor the full background, um, because this is a really complex area. So I thought I would um, tell you about some pending cases, some pending legislation, and, and make a bit of a forecast for you. Um, on the pending legislation front, um, it's really a joke here, um, Maybe some of you are aware that in 2002, the World Trade Organization's appellate body ruled that um, Section 211 of the Omnibus Appropriations Act of 1998 violated certain provisions of the WTO TRIPS agreement, which is the intellectual property agreement of the WTO. And the United States was given a reasonable amount of time um, to bring that law into compliance with the agreement. Um, and that was 2002. So here's the legislative update. There it is. Uh, there has been no uh, development on that front. So this is still an outstanding issue um, that has made no progress in 12 years. On pending lit uh, litigation, there's been a lot of activity. Um, and there are, uh, there, are, uh, <laughs> there are cases that have been litigated for decades that, uh, that are important that I want to tell you about. Um, again, you will be aware of various uh, default judgments against Cuba. Um, there is a pending case in the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, which is Harris versus Cuba, um, in which the plaintiff is seeking to execute his judgment against Cuba upon 61 patents and 44 trademarks. Um, so this is a very interesting invocation of intellectual property uh, into um, one of these default judgments. Um, there are a number of major issues in the case. Uh, one is really a Cuba policy issue, which is whether or not there's jurisdiction under the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. Um, the other issue is whether um, uh, patents and trademarks can be or properly, properly considered as frozen property. Um, and uh, probably there will be a, a ruling on the jurisdiction question. Um, also pending uh, is still uh, two cases um, that involve uh, some of the most famous trademarks uh, coming out of Cuba. Uh, one case on Cohiba, uh, the trademark for cigars, and one case on Havana Club, the trademark for rum. Um, in the Cohiba case, uh, just a month ago, um, there was a petition for cert in the Supreme Court on that case. And what's interesting about that is that is the second petition for cert in this case. Um, but this petition comes from the Federal Circuit, whereas the last petition came from the, the Second Circuit. And the issue uh, presented to the court is whether um, the Cuban Asset Control Regulations uh, bars the Cuban trademark owner from opposing and canceling uh, trademarks in the United States Patent and Trademark Office. 
Um, and what the petition for cert says is that there's a circuit split on this question. The federal circuit uh, ruled this summer that, uh, that the, uh, uh, the CARC does not prohibit um, a party from opposing or canceling uh, registrations in the trademark office. And according to the cert, the second circuit um, ruled quite the opposite. Um, what's interesting about this circuit split is that it's a circuit split in the same case, right? This is the same case that has uh, been appealed to two different circuits. Um, so uh, this is a case to watch, obviously. Um, if the Supreme Court does not grant cert, uh, this case will go back to the trademark office, and uh, it looks, um, I would say, uh, very favorable for the Cuban party in this case, uh, given the prior uh, rulings and uh, given what the, the Federal Circuit has said. Um, the last time um, the party was in this position of having um, some uh, positive outlook, uh, that was exactly when we got Section 211 uh, passed. So, um, you know, this is, again, a case to watch. Uh, including whether there will be any legislative uh, action. Um, Havana Club uh, has also been pending for a, a number of decades. In fact, Havana Club has also been litigated in two federal circuits, uh, has also involved two federal agencies, and has also been pending for two decades. Um, there's a lot of duality here. Um, in 2006, um, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office ordered the cancellation of the Cuban registration of Havana Club. And what's interesting is that the Cuban owner petitioned the commissioner, the, the commissioner of trademarks, to review that order of cancellation. And that petition for review has not yet been denied um, since 2006. So that, that is still pending um, and has not fully been resolved. Um, so on to kind of issue spotting. Um, in much of the litigation involving trademarks, um, and there's been more litigation involving trademarks than copyrights or patents, and, and I'll explain why in a moment, um, there have been a lot of arguments based upon a very little known international convention, which is the General Inter-American Convention for Trademarks and Commercial Protection of 1929. And I've been writing a bit about this treaty uh, and it's, it's, uh, it's a sleeping treaty is what it is. Um, it's still in force between Cuba and the United States and nine other Latin American countries. Um, and very few trademark attorneys in the United States are aware of it. It hasn't really been uh, invoked as much as it could have been. Um, and it was really a treaty that um, at the time it was drafted, um, I think the U.S. trademark bar had its eye on the Cuban market for U.S. goods. Um, so I think that should uh, relations normalize, it will become a treaty um, which more people will know about. I'll say that. Um, now, the reason there have been um, this, uh, this flurry of lit litigation around trademarks is because um, trademark protection is territorial. Um, and that is why we have this uh, weird situation where uh, we have parallel trademarks in Cuba and the United States, right? It's possible to have one word for the same good um, be protected as a trademark in Cuba by one party and in the United States by another party. Obviously, if uh, relations normalize, that will be a big issue. Um, and so that's why we've had attempts um, and we have had some success of different parties owning marks in the United States that are identical to those marks owned by other parties for the same goods in, in Cuba. So uh, looking forward to normalized relations, I can only expect that there will be more disputes. Um, already there have been a number of applications for trademarks filed in the United States involving geographical terms from Cuba um, especially in the area of cigars. Um, and those have been routinely, recently at least, routinely rejected by the trademark office. Um, but I can imagine with more travel to Cuba, there will be more interest um, in exploiting um, uh, 
Cuban cigar brands and Cuban cigar attributes or other geographical attributes. Um, so I, I expect that um, this, may, th this intersection of knowledge about uh, Cuba and intellectual property might be a place of growth in future. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. I've uh, asked Dan to speak last in the hope that he, uh, I should explain, he's with Environmental Defense Fund, has been for some years, and has pioneered the most important environmental projects currently at, uh, at work on the island in the marine field of uh, fisheries conservation and so on. Uh, I've kept Dan to last because I hope he's going to lead us into this bright new dawn of normalized relations with Cuba and what they, they might, might look like in the field of environmental cooperation. Thank you, Robert, and thanks CIS for having me today. Um, I was going to talk about the bright new dawn until Senator Flake mentioned spring break in Havana. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, does normalization mean spring break in Havana or Varadero? Um, that's quite a specter I'll let you chew on. Without normalization, there is very little um, interaction between government agencies in the U.S. and their counterparts in Cuba on the environment. After the BP oil spill, the Cuban government came to, to me, to Environmental Defense Fund and a couple other groups, asking for real-time information on the oil spill because of the lack of diplomatic relations. Eventually, over the course of several weeks, there began to be a channel, channel of communication, and I think even a NOAA vessel was allowed in Cuban waters to take some samples. But without normalization, there's not much going on in terms of government to government. There has been uh, a long history of scientific exchange between academic institutions and NGOs such as mine, but it's been piecemeal, fragmented, and gradual. So, Many people often ask me, isn't the embargo the environment's best friend in Cuba? I mean, isn't that why the environment in Cuba is in such great shape? And I would say, no. U.S. policy gets in the way of environmental protection in Cuba, particularly with respect to our shared resources, the Florida Straits, but many, many uh, resources, ecosystems that we share. That said, there are many challenges. If you think about what a normalized world looks like, there are many challenges for the environment. When I was in Cuba with Bill Riley, the former chief of the EPA and former chair of Obama's Oil Spill Commission, we were very impressed with the rules and regulations in place in, Havana, in, place in Cuba with respect to offshore oil. Very impressive on paper. What Bill Riley said is, once oil revenues start flowing, then it's a game changer then the, the, the will to implement and enforce those rules will be tested. And the, the same thing goes with, you know, if, if, there's a, if there's a surge of American tourism in Cuba, there'll be a demand for golf courses, marinas, gated communities even. There'll be an explosion in fishing boats, uh, new marinas. Uh, the recreational fishing potential in Cuba is tremendous in a time when overfishing is a mounting concern in Cuban waters. You know, Will this uh, surge in tourism result in more Caribbean-style development, sun and sand, you know, more Cancun, or more Costa Rica, where ecotourism is really the brand that uh, Cuba puts out there? Cuba has phenomenal land use planning. Uh, you know, will that be diminished when uh, relations are normalized? Will, will the pressure to to develop in coastal areas just be so great that land use uh, rules fall. On the other hand, there are many opportunities with normalized relations. As I mentioned, I think the U.S. policy gets in the way. Uh, you know, more American visitors. Uh, Americans demand a high-quality tourism product. They, they like bird watching and ecotourism. Um, so, so in many respects, Cuba could become more like a Costa Rica, less like a Cancun, but it has so much more to offer in terms of, of, of what American tourists you know, want to do, uh, art, history, music, et cetera, sports. Also, we would see much greater transfer of technology. Uh, 
wastewater treatment, pollution control, uh, geographic information systems that would help and assist Cuba to do better planning. Uh, also, I think uh, the re uh, renewable energy potential in Cuba is quite high. Uh, the U.S. under normalized relations could, could be a great friend and ally to Cuba in developing its, its wind, its solar, its biofuels, et cetera, uh, especially in, in light of the uh, issues with, with, uh, with oil and, it, and, and Cuba's dependence upon Venezuela and the future of that oil pipeline. In terms of how, how we get to normalization, how the U.S. government would, would move forward, there is precedent. Uh, there are several U.S. Uh, agreements on environmental cooperation in the case of uh, the North American Agreement in, in tandem with NAFTA. There's a pretty impressive agreement on environmental cooperation. There are two good models in, with Peru and Chile as well. And I would suggest that as we move forward with normalization that we start with these umbrella agreements. And the, the North American agreement is a, is a good example. Maybe start there. That's the agreement we have with Mexico and Canada. Uh, if you look at the preamble of that, that agreement, it reaffirms the sovereign right of states to exploit their own resources pursuant to their own in, environmental and developmental policies. It also reaffirms their responsibility to ensure that activities within their borders do not cause damage to the environment outside of their borders. That's a very important principle in terms of U.S.-Cuba relations on the environment. Uh, the notion that we are dealing with two separate states and that the environmental and economic development programs will, in fact, be different. It's also important that we recognize how interrelated our environments are. Usually, I, talk, I start my talk with, with a discussion of just how connected we are ecologically. We, you know, our, our marine ecosystems in the Florida Straits are extremely uh, tightly connected. Our commercial fisheries in Florida depend upon good fisheries management in Cuba, et cetera. The objectives of the North American uh, Agreement on Environmental Cooperation, I, I will just mention a few. One is to promote sustainable development based upon cooperation and mutually supportive environmental and economic policies, to increase the cooperation between parties to better preserve uh, flora and fauna and the great biodiversity in these countries. In the case of NAFTA and our trade agreements with Chile and Peru, it's critical that environmental policy uh, does not create trade distortions or trade barriers. And finally, another objective is to strengthen cooperation on development and improvement of environmental laws. I'm a lawyer, uh, although I work mostly with Cuban scientists, and my own team is comprised mostly of scientists. The way I got started in Cuba is looking at Cuba's very impressive suite of environmental and natural resource management laws, uh, a, an environmental framework that could and should be updated and would benefit if there was uh, cooperation between our two countries. And I'll mention the U.S.-Peru uh, cooperation agreement. Uh, it lists a number of mechanisms for cooperation. I'll just mention a couple. Basic exchanges of uh, professionals, technicians, specialists, et cetera, from NGOs, academic institutions, and governments. In Cuba right now, U.S.-Cuba relations allows the exchange, uh, the interchange of, of NGOs and academic institutions, but again, as I mentioned, not government agencies who are in charge of managing the resource on either side of that line. Uh, the ultimate goal is, is transfer of knowledge and common best practices when it comes to environment and, uh, and resource management. And, and then finally, I'll just mention there are a number of areas of cooperation that we've already begun, but that are in serious need of enhancement. Hurricane preparedness and response, there is some government to government relation there that could be expanded oil spill prevention and response. There is actually an agreement now between the U.S. and Cuba. It involves Mexico, Jamaica, and the Bahamas. It's a significant step forward in coordinating on oil spill prevention and response. We could take that one step further and have a bilateral agreement with Cuba, like our Mexis agreement with Mexico. And then there are opportunities on fisheries management. That's what my group does. We're trying to uh, end overfishing in Cuba. We're trying to manage 
better the migratory marine life in the Gulf of Mexico. There are international conventions that Cuba could become a, uh, a part of, the ICAT, which manages highly pelagic and migratory species. There's a lot of work to be done on coral reefs. There's a, there's a sanctuary program that NOAA has with Mexico called the Sister Sanctuaries. Uh, there's so much more that we share with Cuba. We should expand that program into Cuban waters. We share this deep water coral network extending all the way from where I live in North Carolina into Cuban waters, but there's been no science done yet on, that net, on the, those corals in Cuban waters. Uh, and then finally, I think there's a great opportunity under normalized relations for groups like mine, uh, World Wildlife Fund, the Nature Conservancy, the Sierra Club, to have a greater presence in Cuba, perhaps have an office in Cuba, um, so that we can continue to provide uh, you know, assistance, training, exchange. Also, there's a, there's a great opportunity to expand the environmental community in Cuba. There are several good environmental groups. The foundation of uh, Antonio Nunez Jimenez is a leading example of a really strong environmental and natural resources uh, NGO, and groups like that could proliferate in, in, in a scenario of normalized relations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll have questions now for relating to Gus, Christine, and Dan. Anyone? I see Dan Erickson at the back. Thank you. Uh, the question is actually for the whole panel, not just the last three. Um, my name is Dan Erickson. I work at the State Department. Uh, I really appreciated this panel. It was very interesting. It was refreshingly technocratic, uh, if I could use that phrase. Um, and I know that uh, everyone clearly kind of got instructions to stay on the more technocratic lane, which I think is good. But I did want to bring it back to one of the core political questions, which is on democracy and human rights uh, in Cuba. Um, people can kind of debate how far Cuba is moving in that uh, field or whether the United States should continue to try to advance democracy and human rights. Some people think we should, some people think we shouldn't. Uh, either way, it's probably going to remain a core uh, U.S. foreign policy goal. And I wanted to kind of better understand how some of the different proposals that were laid out here fit into that question. Is it the view of the panelists um, that undertaking some of the steps that you've outlined would actually help? the situation in Cuba with regard to democracy and human rights? Um, is it the view that it may or may not help, but in fact some other core U.S. national interests would be advanced? Uh, I think Dan alluded to that in the environment, but I'd like to hear about some others. And then I think the, the kind of macro question, and I have Bob Muse's article here with a picture of the president uh, on the front, uh, is why should the president choose to kind of revamp and roll the dice on Cuba policy if the uh, future benefits are uh, uh, hypothetical, uh, but the costs uh, are clear. Thank you. Uh, why don't we start with uh, what, what might the benefits to the United States be of normalization? Dan has talked, I think, eloquently in the environmental area. Uh, Jake could speak to uh, trade and the benefits to the U.S. Uh, trade sector. Uh, we can think of some other allocations. I would uh, say one of the great benefits of normalization, and it's not much talked about, is Senator Flake alluded to it, that we exist today in a very curious realm of compromised civil rights and liberties in the United States. We can't go to Cuba. Uh, the United States government sits in judgment on projects that are proposed. Uh, these things, to me, are fundamentally un-American. So one of the first uh, advantages of normalization would be felt domestically at home within essential U.S. values. Uh, let, uh, I think Jake might speak for a minute about some of, he's followed this for many years, of some of the trade advantages to the United States. And, and then, Dan, I'm not neglecting your question about the impact any of this might have within Cuba and some of the values your department and others share. We'll come back to that. Well, I, maybe I will address your question um, a little bit more directly, uh, if that's okay. Um, yeah. 
I thought, you know, I think engaging economically in Cuba can support um, broadly the idea of, of democracy and human rights, um, goals that are sort of shared goals. Uh, I think, you know, the proposal that, that I laid out for uh, enabling Cuban entrepreneurs to engage on online platforms to sell to the United States and, and elsewhere around the world supports economic freedom. It enables Cuban entrepreneurs to, uh, to access the global marketplace. It democratizes the global marketplace for, for Cubans. Um, I, I think generally trade agreements, and, and I, was, I was listening to, um, to Dan and Christine talk about IP and, and environment, uh, trade agreements longer term um, present a, a really useful framework for dealing with a host of issues under that umbrella. And so Dan mentioned the economic cooperation agreements that are part of or um, concurrent to agreements like NAFTA and the U.S.-Chile Free Trade Agreement and the U.S.-Peru Free Trade Agreement. Um, labor is also included in that. Uh, transparency is also included in that. And so, you know, as you get into these negotiations, you deal with issues that do have an impact on workers uh, and on, and on um, freedoms. So I, you know, I think for all of those reasons, uh, in economic engagement and working towards these longer-term trade agreements uh, is really useful. I, the one thing, that, the one, I think, big omission that I forgot to add in my opening remarks was that at least when it comes to market access to changing tariffs, uh, that's a place where Congress does have a role. It's Congress's prerogative to, to change tariffs. And so as you talk about um, deepening the economic relationship and, and working towards, say, a full-fledged trade agreement, which I realize how um, ridiculous that sounds given the current state of the relationship, but over the longer term, that will require Congress, uh, Congress's um, involvement. Mark, you had question uh, that's been asked, and it's, it's really the, a different agenda than we were invited to uh, address, but I'm happy uh, to address it. Uh, the starting point, I think, is um, Senator Flake's point that the embargo is, we're 50 years into the embargo, it has failed uh, to achieve uh, the objectives uh, for which it was designed. Now, I think that, the, of course, the embargo was fully justified back in the day when um, Castro was uh, supporting uh, guerrilla movements in the hemisphere and, el and elsewhere and uh, welcoming a Soviet military presence in Cuba, but that's a long time ago. Gustavo's, is it Gustavo? The point was, is very well taken that Cuba ha has not really cooperated uh, in um, providing conditions for normalization. I, the way I see it, the primary U.S. interest in Cuba right now is to provide as much, con as it's not within our control, but to provide a political diplomatic environment for the Cubans to decide that they want to move on their own to loosen up the restrictions the somewhat authoritarian, if not totalitarian, restrictions on their own society. The Cubans are, I think, uh, are somewhat in the same position as the authorities in Tehran right now. They're afraid uh, of that rapprochement would weaken their uh, system in place uh, in Cuba. That's my take. I'm not a political scientist, but uh, that, that's my judgment. Uh, we are not getting anywhere. Uh, with our current policy. I think that's established. Um, uh, and I would hope uh, that we could begin to take moves that might encourage uh, the Cubans to enter into a relationship with us that would benefit the Cuban people uh, as well as American, the America's posture in the world. I think you're, uh, we're entering a phase I think it's pretty clear that the Cuban, our Cuban embargo policy has become a burden on our relations with the rest of the hemisphere, and it's going to become more costly in the future, as I see it. Gustavo? Let me see if I can answer uh, this question also uh, on a technocratic uh, level. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, one of the requirements of being a member of the World Bank uh, is that you're a member of the, uh, of the IMF. Uh, and almost by definition, becoming, being a member of the IMF would subject Cuba to certain conditions that would, quite frankly, expose 
uh, Cuba's uh, policies, uh, the fundamental contradictions uh, that exist currently uh, in Cuba. Uh, whether or not those would have political implications in Cuba or not, you know, I don't know. Uh, but that would certainly be one of the advantages to Cuba being a member of the IMF, providing the kind of information they have to require, et cetera. By the way, Cuba left in 1964 because they were about to be kicked out of the IMF for failure to comply with a number of different provisions, requirements of, of members, including the provision of, of, of information, and at the same time, they had to leave the, the World Bank. Uh, on, at the, at the, with respect to the ID, IDB, and I didn't have a chance to talk about this earlier, so uh, if you, uh, you know, Cuba was an original member, uh, oh, Cuba, sorry, signed their charter of the IDB back in 1959, but they never uh, ratified the agreement. They never took the steps to subscribe for shares, et cetera. That's why Cuba has never been a member of the IDB. Uh, having lost the opportunity to become a member at the uh, at the original, you know, when the charter was uh, was was uh, was was signed, uh, Cuba would have to come in through another provision, which is that membership is open to members of the OAS. Now, there's a debate we can have as to whether or not Cuba is a member. Cuba, uh, in in principle, is a member. Cuba's membership was suspended in 1962, I believe it was. That suspension was reversed in 2009. But subject to the condition that Cuba agree uh, to certain obligations under the OAS Charter, including uh, be, you know, signing the Inter-American Human Rights Charter, something that they, they have derided, something they have said specifically they're not willing to do. And as of today, Cuba has taken a very negative stance towards joining the OAS. And so my reading of the Charter of the IDB is that currently Cuba would not be able to join the IDB simply because it doesn't e e itself consider uh, a member of the OAS, and at the end of the day, the IDB would would uh, would defer to the OAS providing a certificate, some kind of certification that Cuba is a member of the OAS, and I'm not sure that they'd be willing to do that in the in the current context. Thank you. Do we have other questions? Can I can I jump in? Oh, sorry, sorry? Christine, go ahead. Maybe Dan wants to as well. Um, so intellectual property law, it, it, the purpose of intellectual property law is to promote the development of human expression and research and development of sciences, and also to facilitate the sharing of human expression and research. Um, so I think it definitely relates to human rights objectives. Um, anybody who knows anything about Cuba knows that the sciences and the arts are absolutely flourishing in Cuba. Mm -hmm. um, but most uh, US intellectual property lawyers would be very surprised to know that intellectual property law is also flourishing in Cuba. Um, the Cubans are very sophisticated uh, about intellectual property law, and their laws are um, as harmonious with the United States laws as any other countries. Um, so they're very up to date. And we just have the embargo, which is, which is now uh, providing the block of that sharing of research and expression. And I, I don't see how that can um, be consistent with the goals of, of human rights. I'll add real quickly. Um, a clean and healthy environment is a basic human right. I think that's wi widely agreed upon and understood around the world. That's reflected in Article 26 of Cuba's Constitution. Uh, I, I would note that our own Constitution does not give citizens a right to a clean and healthy environment. Progress has, has been made, to some extent at least, under the body of environmental law that started in 1997 and continues. I think that environmental cooperation would um, do three things, essentially. I think it would increase awareness of the importance of Cuba's environment, biodiversity, natural heritage, both inside of Cuba and outside of Cuba. I think there's not that much awareness, even in the U.S., about how important Cuba is to the region, environmentally and ecologically. Number two, I think it would increase uh, environmental standards and living conditions in Cuba. It would result in in implementation of these laws we discussed. And then finally, I think, and this is already happening in Cuba, I think environmental cooperation will lead to greater uh, public participation in decision making, uh, and particularly in environmental decision making. Take uh, fisheries management, for example. The Cuban government is in the process of trying to update its fisheries management uh, you know, uh, rules at, so that they're more sustainable. You're not going to achieve sustainable fisheries management in Cuba unless fishermen and coastal communities participate in that process and buy into that process. And again, we're already seeing that. So I think environmental cooperation can only advance that further. 
The only thing I would add, I mean, I think that the White House has already taken very important steps uh, to promote the free flow of information to the Cuban people, to support private economic activity in Cuba, and all of these have an important democracy and human rights component to them. Uh, the issue is that if groups carrying out those missions um, are impeded uh, by their inability to access financial services and banking, um, it's, you know, that itself is a problem, and addressing that problem first, I think, can, can, can take things that the White House has already authorized and make them far more effective uh, on the island. Do we have other questions for this panel? My name is Dan Nichols with NGA, a National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. And um, a couple of items that you, the panel brought up earlier went by, by in a blur, and um, I thought I, we could maybe revisit a, one or two of them. Uh, one is, uh, Mr. Ajo, you mentioned that uh, the, the U.S. Uh, or excuse me, the, the Cuban interest section um, had a 30-year relationship with the bank, and then that relationship was halted. And the question that I have is. Uh, what prompted the cessation of that relationship? And then uh, I have three other questions that all revolve around the same topic, but not a small one, which has to do with the uh, state-sponsored uh, terrorism issue. Uh, what are the arguments for keeping Cuba on the state-sponsored uh, terrorist list? And when were they put on, and why were they put on? Maybe I should begin with the terrorist sponsoring list. We'll come back to Matthew. Uh, Cuba was put on the list, I'm pretty sure, in 1982. And there were expressed reasons for it being put on the list, that principally its support for in Marxist uh, insurrectionary movements in Central America, Sandinistas, MFLN, and El Salvador. And is an interesting uh, legal note. The Supreme Court upheld the embargo based on affidavits from the Department of Defense, principally, saying there's a national security uh, element to this Cuban support for these liberation movements, as Cuba styled them. So they were put on the list in 1982. They've been on ever since. Uh, Fidel Castro said in 19, uh, approximately 1995, we're broke and we're out of the revolution business here, at least as far as exporting it. And I think that has held true ever since. The current, uh, the current stated reasons by the State Department for keeping Cuba on the list become uh, ever more difficult to tease out each year. Uh, there's, it's said that, well, there are some FARC uh, relationships. But in fact, Cuba is hosting the negotiations between FARC and the government of Colombia. There's some comment periodically, Wayne Smith is uh, spoken on this issue for many years, about some ETA, Basque separatists, living in Cuba. Well, they're living there at the request of the Spanish government that doesn't particularly want these hard men back home, right? So we're left then with very little. Uh, there is a comment periodically that Cuba is harboring fugitives from U.S. justice. That alone does not constitute support for international terrorism. Uh, I've written on that subject if you're interested. So as long ago as the Clinton administration, uh, Richard Nuccio, Clinton's principal Cuba advisor, not long after leaving that job, said to the Miami Herald that uh, everybody agrees Cuba doesn't belong on this list, but there's a political cost, perceived cost, in taking it off. If somebody wants to correct me and, and give objective details of why Cuba might be on that list, I'd be happy to hear it. But I haven't heard that from State Department itself for some years. I don't mean this to sound like advocacy. I mean it to sound like frustration right, at this point. So uh, I hope that's answered your question. Matthew? Yeah, on the, uh, on the banking issue, uh, I think the key thing uh, to remember, and I've had discussions with the bank about this, is that the decision to cease providing services to the Cuban diplomatic mission was a business decision. 
It wasn't a political decision. They had had a functioning relationship. It was a profitable relationship for the bank. But in the ever more complicated uh, risk compliance uh, you know, evaluation process, uh, the bank took a decision that it was no longer going to provide services to diplomatic missions of any kind. Um, it, the, it considered those types of accounts, diplomatic accounts, to rise above a risk threshold that it was comfortable with. The, I think, almost more interesting uh, component to that sort of issue is that since the diplomatic mission was dropped, and, and mind you, this is a case in which the U.S. government is prepared to provide assurances not only to the bank, but also provide licenses to the mission itself, is the fact that um, for over a year now, um, the U.S. government has reached out to dozens of banks in an effort to find a replacement. We're talking here about a checking account so that they can stop receiving cash. And as of now, uh, at least in the case of the interest section, there has not been a bank, large or small, U.S. or non-U.S., that's been willing to take on these accounts. Um, and it's, again, it, it boils down to risk and to banks' perceived risks. And I think an important thing to tease out, which is that if the risk uh, matrix reaches a level of complexity at which it's almost incomprehensible, the issue is that it's the unknown. It's the bank that, you know, was doing everything complying with OFAC and gets a letter from the Justice Department. It's the fact that there is no rule book that is, you know, that is, that is clear enough and, 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 and compelling enough that, uh, that a bank would follow it. And, and this is, you know, it started with the interest section. I assure you it's bleeding into other areas. Um, some of the big dollar clearinghouse banks are getting very uh, anxious about um, wire transfers. I've gotten several calls in the last few weeks about wire transfers that just disappear. And these are from groups that have licenses that have been, you know, that have been engaged in these activities for many years. And you know, it's not that the money doesn't resurface; it does. But figuring out where it is and why it never reached its recipient uh, is an issue. And I think in the next few months, we're going to see this play out in a variety of different areas. I'd like to return to the tariff sponsoring list just for a minute to make the point: it's not cost-free to the United States, uh, as Matthew's been describing. Uh, one of the reasons to take Cuba off the list is Cuba can be sued. It loses diplomatic immunity, or uh, the uh, sovereign immunity, uh, because it's on the list. This has resulted in dozens of lawsuits being filed in Miami. They're awarded by default. They're not defended by the government of Cuba. And then these cases are now starting to hit the international financial markets. They're trying to seize dollar transfers, they're going after accounts. Their uh, illustrative case is a man that has a judgment, I believe, for close to $4 billion against Cuba, a default judgment. He got it in the Dade County Court. And that's based on his father committing suicide, I believe, after their car dealership and gasoline station was nationalized in Cuba in 1960, I believe. All these years later, a $4 billion freshly delivered judgment against Cuba. That lawyer was quoted only a few days ago as saying he hopes to harvest $20 million out of these dollar accounts, which in many cases represent legitimate trade between Cubas buying wheat from uh, Argentina. The dollars, all dollars come through the New York depository system. So these uh, uh, ravenous packs of lawyers are now trying to grab this money. They have an interest in doing it. They get 33 and a third percent of anything they can grab, as you know, on a contingency arrangement. Uh, so it is not, it's further complicating attempts to do the good things the president has done, support people to people travel. That requires the payment for hotel rooms in Cuba. These transfers are being held up. So I would ask the U.S. government to start intervening in these cases. File a statement of interest, there's a legal procedure for doing it, and say the cases are baseless because you have to demonstrate Cuba was a terrorist-sponsoring nation 
at the time of the complaint of action. Cuba was listed in 1982. This man committed suicide in 1960 or 61. Now, one of those lawsuits meets the basic jurisdictional requirement of the statute, which uh, uh, Mark Feldman was very much involved in, the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. So that requires our government moving on this. Uh, and ideally, they will. This is and, a follow up and, and before Matt. you uh, before you go, this is the last question because we're at noon now and uh, we're going to wrap up. So go on. Sure. This is a question on the follow up. Oh, this is James Williams with the Trimpa Group. Um, this is a follow up on the banking question. Um, given all that, you know, and sort of this is not just a Cuba problem, although their case is probably the most severe example of this. If what are the is there are there steps right so say the state sponsor of terrorism list goes say there's more sanction relief is that still going to be enough is that going to be enough to incentivize a bank to want to take this account because at some point all these other steps are totally untenable if Cuba can't even get a bank like how are we going to have trade relations with a country without a bank right and so are there things beyond that that need to happen for you know you think this make it worthwhile enough or what are we looking at here in terms of the future prognosis? James, I wish that I knew the answer to that question. Um, I think that there are other people in this room, even potentially some from the U.S. government, who wish they could answer that question. Um, you know, it's one of, the, one of the important differences between Cuba and the United States, and this frustrates the Cubans to no end, I assure you, is that the U.S. government can't tell a bank to take the accounts. You know, it's, it, the bank ha has the right to make its own business decision about whether or not it, it, it services a customer. Um, and there's a risk reduction side, which obviously needs to be met. The removal of Cuba from the state sponsors of terrorism list, I think we're in consensus, would remove some element of risk, but there are others. Where we reach that tipping point um, on the risk side, I can't tell you for sure. Uh, on the reward side, because from a business decision, it's cost-benefit. On the benefit side, um, you know, a lot of these groups are already uh, working in a high fee area. Uh, you know, groups are willing to pay high costs for a banking relationship, uh, on higher, much higher than normal costs. Um, but you know, it's not. If you're, let's take, if you're a large bank, you know, let's say that you're. I don't want to name a specific large bank, but let's take a large bank. And this would be a very small portion of your overall portfolio. And you run afoul somehow of OFAC uh, licensing provisions. The issue is that it's not the funds in question in those particular accounts that are at risk. It's the assets of your bank, all the other assets. And so name a bank that's going to put you know, millions or billions of dollars of assets in one area on the line for this small other area. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, so we don't have a full answer. I will say that there are cases, very, there are success stories. Um, I think, you know, Western Union is clearly a, a success story. They have continued operations. They have global operations in some, you know, comp in some complicated and, com and complex areas. Uh, and, and they've been successful. Uh, they spend a quarter of a billion dollars a year on compliance. Uh, so, you know, maybe it's that, maybe the niche is the answer, uh, but it's going to be a, a combination of different things. And assurances from the, from the, from the U.S. government uh, would, would go a long way. Uh, yeah. Jake, quickly. Yeah, just real quickly, I do think that um, something that Matt talked about before was there's this threshold issue, though, that would make a, a lot of difference in terms of removing them from the terror list. What banks face is um, sort of, OFAC officials speaking out of both sides of their mouths. They'll go um, to banks and say, well, yes, it's okay if you, do the Cuba, if you do this business with Cuba. But then they'll go back to them and say, and by the way, Iran is on the um, state sponsors of terrorism list, and you have to divest yourself of all uh, accounts related to Iran. Um, and so just by virtue of being associated with these other bad actors on the terrorism list, there is this additional amount of risk that banks face. Uh, and they don't tend to differentiate. And so removing them from the state sponsors of ter terrorism list would, I think, diminish that risk. Well, I want to thank everyone 
on this panel. I think it's been most informative. Thank you. So in closing, and Elizabeth, could you please join me up here? Uh, my co-host here, uh, the director of the Cuba Project uh, at the Center for International Policy. I want to thank all of you for coming. Uh, I think uh, this was a lively, useful, bipartisan, mixed, very diverse group, which I think already uh, symbolically means something when dealing with Cuba. Uh, we got all kinds of different views. I think it, 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 it was important in, in that regard. I think we did what we said we were going to do. Uh, for the most part, it was a technocratic uh, panel, as was said, and I think uh, folks' views came up at the end. So if the President of the United States were interested in normalizing relations with Cuba, I think this panel would be a great starting point. So thank you. I invite you all to lunch, uh, and uh, I look forward to seeing you at other events. Thank you. <laughs>